This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, it's the truth. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. First, of course, we want to get to the weather. That major storm that is on the move, alert spreading across 24 states this morning as that dangerous system brings tornadoes, heavy snow, and flash flooding. Ginger starts us off with the very latest. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning, Michael. This is an alarming image to wake up to if you're in Atlanta or Dothan, Alabama, Montgomery, too. That's a tornado watch until noon. Those storms firing right into that low pressure system. Severe thunderstorm warning just northwest of Atlanta. This thing already brought 13 reported tornadoes. That is the moment severe storms blew through New Orleans. You can't see that building. And one of more than 60 reports of severe thunderstorms from Louisiana to Tennessee. Trees littering the road in Martinville, Mississippi. Golly, that's got to be a tornado. Winds close to 60 miles per hour in NOLA. <laughs> dropping large hail. Crushing cars. In Pickens, Mississippi, several homes shattered by a tornado. Their neighbors in Vaughn hit with the twister, too. In Missouri, up to six inches of snow. I-70 shut down near the Missouri River Bridge, a pileup leaving a log jam of tractor trailers. Across Oklahoma, vehicle after vehicle ending up on the sides of the roads. This tanker sliding into a creek east of Chickasha. The driver hospitalized but expected to recover. And in Texas, snow plows out in full force in Wichita Falls. The snow and cold diving as far south as El Paso. So we know this storm has the capability of creating tornadoes. So who has to watch for that today? I want to take you straight into the region right along that Florida Georgia state line. That's who could potentially see the highest risk of a tornado today. But you could also see a damaging wind anywhere from Orlando. So central Florida right up the east coast. The I-95 corridor gets through it today into the early evening hours. If you're in Charleston or say Raleigh, you're not out of the woods. You have that line coming at you. And again, within it, 60 mile power winds that can take down power lines and certainly trees. Cecilia. Be rough out there. Okay, Ginger, thank you. We're going to turn out of that historic victory for President Trump in the impeachment trial. The Senate acquitting him on both charges. This was a straight party line vote, except for Senator Mitt Romney, who did something no politician has ever done before, voting to remove his own party's president from office. Our senior national correspondent Terry Moran is there at the White House with the very latest. And Terry, President Trump expected to take a victory lap just a few hours from now. He will. Good morning, Cecilia. The president will have a press conference at noon. Today he's expected to dunk on the Democrats. That's his style. But the result was never in doubt here. The Senate was not going to convict the president. It takes two-thirds of the senators to do that. But there was drama. Mitt Romney and what he called a cry of conscience that he hopes would echo through history and that enraged the White House. After months of fighting, the verdict is in. Donald John Trump, president of the United States, is not guilty as charged. The Senate sitting as a court of impeachment stands adjourned, sine die. President Trump and his team victorious. The president won. The office of the president won. The Constitution won. But the vote from Republican senators was not unanimous. Mr. Romney. Guilty. Mitt Romney becoming the first senator in history to vote to remove a president from his own party in a dramatic speech saying it was his oath before God that guided his decision. My faith is at the heart of who I am.
I take an oath before God as enormously consequential. Romney said the evidence is clear. President Trump pressured Ukraine to investigate Joe and Hunter Biden for his own political gain. There's no question in my mind that were their names not Biden, the president would never have done what he did. The president is guilty of an appalling abuse of public trust. The president and the senator from Utah have a tumultuous past, and Romney predicted his decision would bring swift retribution. I'm sure to hear abuse from the president and his supporters. He was right. Donald Trump Jr. saying Romney, the 2012 Republican presidential nominee, should be expelled from the party. Overnight, the president tweeting, had failed presidential candidate Mitt Romney devoted the same energy and anger to defeating a faltering Barack Obama as he sanctimoniously does to me. He could have won the election. Republicans have long argued that impeachment would play right into Trump's hands in the next election. Exoneration comes when President Trump gets reelected because the people of the United States are fed up with this crap. But Democrats still insist the president's day of reckoning will come. My message is simple. Don't lose hope. There is justice in this world and truth and right. Many Democrats are demoralized, but some are talking about continuing the investigations. House Judiciary Committee Jerry Nadler says he wants to subpoena John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor, and see what he has to say. Other Democrats are saying it might be time to move on, find other issues to run on against President Trump in November. Robin? Many are saying that. Okay, thank you. To one of five military facilities in California, Texas, and Nebraska, Will Carr is at one of them. He's there at Travis Air Force Base near Sacramento with more. Good morning, Will. Michael, with those cases of coronavirus surging, there are now two more planes set to come back to the United States packed with Americans. They will be monitored every step of the way and then go into quarantine for at least two weeks. This morning, hundreds of Americans in Wuhan, ground zero for the novel coronavirus, are stuck, all waiting to board the plane back to the United States. But they told us that we have a mandatory 14-day quarantine. Sergio McCray from Virginia has been teaching in Wuhan for six years. He decided to evacuate because of the conditions. Wuhan, once a transportation hub in central China, is now deserted. These images show the streets, bridges, and the airport. With the city on lockdown, Wuhan has turned into a ghost town. They're trying their best to make sure people aren't spreading this. It does make one feel a bit trapped. Yu Lin, a resident and passenger on a recent flight, is grateful for the State Department's evacuation as well as the food and resources on his flight back. He's now quarantined stateside. Right now, it looks, it still looks bad, I, I think, because the, the medical resources are so overwhelmed, a lot more... Um, medical staff from all over the country coming to help. Overnight here in the U.S., three adults and one child who just arrived from China were all hospitalized with a fever or a cough. They're now under observation in San Diego. This comes as a 12th American just tested positive for the virus, the latest in Wisconsin. So far, two of those infected caught the virus from a spouse. The rest brought coronavirus back from China. CDC says the virus is most likely spreading when someone sneezes or coughs. But can somebody spread the virus without showing symptoms? Is it possible? Yes. We do not think this is uh, driving the outbreak. This is an emerging uh, virus, and so we're still learning more and more every day. A cruise ship off the coast of Japan carrying more than 3,500 people confirmed 10 more passengers tested positive, including two Americans. Roger and Carrie Meniscalco, an American couple, are on the ship quarantined in their rooms. We have no interaction with any other guests, so we're just uh, opening up our door to get uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Japan is already on edge. With just six months to go before the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, local media is reporting the chief executive of the Games admits they're, quote, extremely worried about the virus's impact on the Olympics. As for the next round of Americans coming back to the United States from China, they're set to go to two military bases, one in San Antonio, Texas, the other in Omaha, Nebraska. Cecilia. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're going to turn to the race for the White House now. The New Hampshire primary just five days away, but the results. Good morning, everyone. I just got back from the prayer breakfast, so let's all be very prayerful. As you know, this week we had the State of the Union as required by the Constitution of the United States, 
uh, the president is to submit in writing or in person his uh, statement of the State of the Union. Uh, what happened instead was the president using the Congress of the United States as a backdrop for a reality show, presenting a state of mind that had no contact with reality whatsoever. Uh, it was quite appalling to hear the president say the 150 at least million families in America uh, that are faced with pre-existing medical conditions about a benefit that is afforded to them in the Affordable Care Act, that he was protecting that benefit, when in fact he has done everything to dis dismantle it. In fact, we are fighting him in the courts right now to preserve that benefit. That misrepresentation was appalling and so clearly untrue. And next he talked about pre, uh, the, the, another issue of concern to America's working families, the issue of the cost of prescription drugs. As I've said to you before, I've seen grown men cry across the country when it comes to the fact that they cannot afford the prescription drugs and meet their other obligations to their families. And we had talked about negotiating for lower prices. That's the only way you're going to get lower prices. During the campaign, the president said he was going to negotiate like crazy. I think like crazy means maybe not at all. I've said that to you before, uh, because the president's statements have sent pharma socks soaring. And for him to represent that he was working on that. We had been working on it. We were hopeful to get something done. I guess pharma must have stepped in. And then he talked about saving Medicare, Medicare, Medicare and Social Security uh, when, in fact, in his budget, the 220 budget that he submitted, $2, two trillion dollars uh, were uh, re uh, uh, decreased in Medicare and Medicaid that it combined, including to, uh, in terms of Social Security, uh, reduce the disability benefit in Social Security. So these, you know, one after another, right to the kitchen table of America's working families uh, to serve up uh, these falsehoods. What appalling also was when he was trying to discredit the triumph of the Obama administration on the economy. And I've given you a, 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 a paper on this uh, put out by the Joint Economic Committee under leadership of uh, Don Beyer, our House uh, Vice Chair, on that. And it talks about all the things, job creation and the rest. But to succinctly put it, uh, when President Obama came into office, the unemployment rate was 10 percent. When he left, it was 5 percent. So President Trump did not inherit a mess. He inherited a momentum of job creation. Uh, when President Obama came into office, the stock market was at 6,000. When he left, it was at 18,000. Again, momentum that the administration was able to build on. Not a mess. Uh, uh, the, uh, during the eight years of the Obama, President Obama's presidency, he reduced the deficit by a trillion dollars. Instead, this administration is increasing the trillion dollars. And, of course, with their tax cut their tax scam for 83% of the benefits going to the top 1%. They increased the national debt by $2 trillion. And therefore, they tried to pay, it was supposed to pay for itself, but instead they went to Medicare and Medicaid uh, to try to pay for that. But we're not doing that. And then during, um, during the eight years of President, and when President Bush was pre president, the job growth was slow. Under President Obama, we gained more than 14 million private sector jobs. And during his presidency, more than, and, and that is uh, uh, far more in a prorated in terms of years than what this president has created. A, a, a momentum, a path of 14 million dollars is not a mess, Mr. President. And then during his presidency, we uh, uh, rescued the auto industry and all that that brought back to the economy. And during the administration, more than 20 million people were afforded quality, affordable health care. But more, in, in addition to that, 150 million families with pre-existing conditions uh, got a new benefit that enabled them 
to have access to health care as well as uh, other benefits of no lifetime limit, no annual limit. Child is up until 26 years old can stay on your benefit. Being a woman, no longer a pre-existing condition. So when he talks about, oh, I'm going to make health care, the, 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 the fact is he did not... He did not inherit a mess. He heard a momentum of growth in our economy. And many more statistics are in the, what I hope you will read, uh, because it was appalling to hear him try to take credit for something that he, uh, and call what the President Obama did a mess that he inherited, when in fact it was a great advantage to the country uh, that President Obama's policies took us uh, to that very positive place of growth and of uh, job creation and deficit reduction. And I talk to my members and they have ideas. I always say, what does your idea do for growth, for creation of good paying jobs and reducing the deficit? Let's see how it meets uh, those standards, uh, what the president has done is not that. And so for him to make it as if he did all this stuff and all the rest, he still hasn't even matched President Obama's growth in the stock market, if you call that uh, a, a real measure of success. And, and in some respects, it's a good indicator. But it's not an indicator of what is happening at the kitchen tables of America's working families, where they're concerned about the fact that many of them have not received a raise in a very long time. Uh, that if 40% of them could not find $500 for an emergency. The uh, president goes on and saying, oh, we took uh, many more, because of all my growth, many more people are not on food stamps. No, you kicked them off. I know many more people are not taking advantage of this. No, you kick them off. And that just isn't a fair thing to do in our economy. So it was, a, 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 in my view, a manifesto of, of mistruths, of falsehoods blatantly really dangerous to the well-being of the American people if they believed what he said. So again, we do not want the, the chamber of the House of Representatives to be used as a backdrop for one of his reality shows with unreality in his presentation. And by the way, a serious breach to start shouting four more years on the floor of the House. Totally inappropriate. We're very excited about how we're going forward to honor our promises to the American people. For the people, we're going to lower the cost of health care by lowering the cost of prescription drugs. And we're on our path with H.R. 3. You saw people holding up the three H.R. 3. Maybe just three benefits from it. People should know uh, that it will lower the cost of prescription drugs for them. Uh, it will also increase benefits in Medicare, dental, hearing, and uh, visual a vision in the uh, expansion of Medicare, which is the biggest expansion since its inception, that that benefit will apply to not only Medicare, the, uh, the uh, reduction in cost will not only apply to Medicare, but to all of the uh, insurance plans uh, for, uh, for prescription drugs. We're very excited about HR3. Lower health care costs by lowering the cost of prescription drugs and protecting the pre-existing <laughs> medical condition benefit. Secondly, bigger paychecks, building the infrastructure of America in a green, resilient way. We thought we were in a good place on both of those scores with the president because we had negotiated with the White House on H.R. 3 until the president decided to go with pharma instead of with the American people. Uh, uh, we thought we were on a good path uh, in uh, negotiating with the administration on what the infrastructure bill would contain. Last night he talked about rural broadband. He didn't even know what that was when we were first talking about it. So it's just roads and stuff, no, no roads, bridges, uh, water, broadband, and the rest. And uh, so bigger paychecks by doing the He talked about some mini plan. He sent over a $200 billion plan, which he then said is a bad plan. It is. It's too small, but too much burden on the localities. So we have really important. And then, of course, our third agenda, lower health care costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. We think we have a shot with them on the first two, uh, but not on the third, cleaner government. No, that's not something that they, they, he, or the Republicans have as a value. So yesterday, the Senate acted first time in history that uh, a senator has voted against his own president in a uh, 
a decision regarding uh, impeachment. God bless him for his courage. This morning, the president said, when president, people use faith as an excuse to do, I don't know if he said bad things, but whatever he said it was just so completely inappropriate, especially at a prayer breakfast. So again, we will be expanding our, what we've talked about before, about our infrastructure bill, surface transportation, water systems, uh, broadband, rural broadband, urban desert broadband, uh, very important to health, education, commerce, and the rest for our country. And then we'll go further with our uh, initiatives on infrastructure for, for school construction and some housing initiatives and initiatives that relate to our, the needs of, of our veterans. We'll be unfolding some of that in the week ahead. Uh, so we continue, continue, continue to do our work, 275 or more bipartisan bills on Mitch McConnell's desk. The Grim Reaper has not taken any of them up. If he had one, I wish he would do, I have my bullet here, I wish he would do background check legislation, which would save lives. So it is uh, uh, an interesting time as we go forward. We'll also be taking up in the, in the next week uh, the ERA, the legislation related to the ERA, and there's a great deal of excitement across the country. You see what happened in Virginia, and we're hoping to move the date to include that, uh, that new state and, and that number uh, to promote women, especially in this year when we observe the 100th anniversary of women having the right to vote. I know what you're going to say, Chad. What happened to the 49ers? Uh, I'll, I'll ask that at the end. Yeah, but, but uh, just when you're thinking of it, think about your own team, okay? <laughs> well, we're going to get the first round draft. <laughs> well, there's always that. There's always that. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, just, you just mentioned things like prescription drugs and infrastructure. Yes. What do you think is the likelihood of being able to work with President Trump on these things, given what at least appears to be a strained relationship with you? Well, we've had a strained relationship for a while, and we were able to keep government open and push back on his um, threats to shut down government if we didn't do this and we didn't do that, and that's right. And uh, uh, I was very proud of the work in a bipartisan way, of our appropriators, left to their own devices, you've heard me say, they can really work things out, and, and we did, and we pushed back on any threats of shutdown. So we worked together on that. We worked together on the uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, he bragged about delivering it. I don't know if he even knows what's in it because it's so far different of whatever he sent us to begin with, but it does have what I've said to you many times, it did, does have a framework of enforcement for the protection of our workers, protection of our environment, and getting rid of his gift to pharma. Imagine he had a gift to pharma in that, in that uh, trade agreement. Well, we kicked, uh, kicked that out, just another example of his beholdenness uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. So we, we, we got two major uh, things accomplished. Uh, these are things the president said he wanted to do, reduce the cost of prescription drugs and build the infrastructure during the campaign, especially infrastructure. I hardly ever had a conversation with him when he wasn't talking about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I think he really wants that. I think he knows our country needs that, and I hope that we... We were almost there until it was time to pay for it, and then he was like, out the door. So you don't think anything's changed because of the impeachment? You think you'll still be able to... Well, that would be up to him. It certainly hasn't changed in terms of us. As people said to me, why would you give him a victory on the trade agreement? I said, it's not a victory for him. Not to do that uh, for the benefit it provides for our farmers, our manufacturers, our workers in our country, our hemisphere, uh, I think would be wrong. I mean, he just wasn't that important that we would walk away from what they were conceding to us but they were conceding to us in that legislation. If we didn't get what we want, we couldn't go that path, but we did. Now, did we get everything? No, it was a negotiation, uh, but it's a path to much better trade agreements, and I'm, I'm pleased we did it. Madam yes, Chad. Yeah. Uh, the White House Communications Director has indicated that she, the President, and maybe others with the administration, may want to have some payback for what uh, the impeachment and what the Senate did here. When you hear that sort of language, and as we speak, the, the U.S. Capitol Police are investigating a suspicious packet, excuse me, substance in the office of Congressman Schiff. Oh, no. Well, I don't think that has anything to but do with the said, White but, House. But, no. but, but, when you, but when you hear that rhetoric from the White House, and what, what does that make you think? 
Well, let me just say that, that that language is, first of all, the whole State of the Union was beneath the dignity of the White House, an insult to the Congress of the United States and the American people. So their uh, language is uh, nothing that surprises anyone. But they have to know that when the White House speaks, those words weigh a ton. And they are giving uh, encouragement to people to do things. Just as, remember, Charlottesville, people are coming down that hill with tiki torches saying, the Jews will not replace us. The Jews will not replace us. And what was the president's statement? They're good people on both sides. Really? The Jews will not replace us and are good people on both sides? So they, uh, there's a uh, mysterious view that they have about what their words, uh, the weight their words carry. And there are people out there who, uh, for whatever purpose, I know I'm, Constantly, I mean, I don't want to even go into the target that I am because of them, but I can't worry about that. But that was there even before them, just working with President Obama stirred up some of those same people. But the, um, uh, I, I, I mean, I would like to think that it had nothing to do with what the White House was saying, but I do think they should rein in their comments because what they're saying is they're going to be payback to us for upholding the Constitution of the United States, for honoring the vision of our founders, for a democracy, a republic, if we can keep it, uh, for something our men and women in uniform fight to protect our freedom, our Constitution, and the aspirations of our children that depend on living in a democracy that is unquestioned in terms of that, where we have freedom of the press to be guardians of that democracy. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not very fond of commenting on anything they say. Uh, but if it's threatening, it's wrong. Several members of the various House investigative committees have indicated that they would like to subpoena John Bolton. What's your position on that, and, and when should it happen? I want to first salute our managers. I think they did a magnificent job in presenting the case for our founders, for our Constitution, uh, for our country. We could not have been better served. Each and every one of them did a magnificent job. And Adam Schiff's leadership uh, was a blessing to our country. I'm proud of the work that the Senate did uh, in terms of uh, their response to all of this and their the unanimous vote on the House Democrats in support of our Constitution. Uh, we are now, the, the Senate has spoken in terms of any punishment to the president. He's impeached forever, no matter what he says or whatever headlines he wants to carry around. You're impeached forever. You're never getting rid of that scar. Uh, and history will always record that you were impeached for undermining the security of our country, jeopardizing the integrity of our elections, and violating the Constitution of the United States. Our purpose in all of this, in addition to holding him accountable so he stops doing what he's doing and no future president thinks that she or he uh, could have liberty to take us away from a republic, if you can keep it, to a Second Amendment enables me to do whatever I want. No, that's not what our Constitution is about. So we will continue to do our oversight to protect and defend the Constitution, which is three co-equal branches of government, each a check and balance on the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, some we have some cases in court now, McCann and taxes and that, and, and that will take time. We didn't need to have that come to a fruition uh, with, because we had a strong enough case to impeach and remove, but th those cases still exist. If there are others that we see as an opportunity, we'll make a judgment at that time. But we have no plans right now. Speaker Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, yes, ma'am. Could you describe what you were thinking this morning as the president said that impeachment was a terrible ordeal put through by corrupt dishonest people, by the Democrats, and also the suggestion that you don't have to I don't know if the president understands about prayer or people who do pray. Uh, but we do pray uh, for the United States of America. I pray for him, our president, President Bush, still President Obama, because it's a heavy responsibility. And uh, I pray hard for him because he's so off the track of our Constitution, our values, our country, the air our children breathe, the water they drink, and the rest. He really needs our prayers. So he can say whatever he wants. 
he can say whatever he wants, but I do pray for him, and I do so sincerely and without anguish. You know, I gently, that's why I pray for everybody else. Uh, I thought what he said about what he said about Senator Romney was particularly without class. What did he say? There's some people who use faith as an excuse to do the wrong things. So you remember what he said about Romney? You got that there? What a... Well, it's so inappropriate at a prayer breakfast. You want to go to the prayer breakfast, prayer in the school, vouchers, a woman's right to choose, all those things that that's a ripe audience for. God bless you. That's It's a prayer breakfast, and that's something about faith. You know, it may not be something I agree with, but it's appropriate. But to go into the stock market and raising up his acquittal thing and mischaracterizing uh, other people's motivation, he's talking about things that he knows little about, faith and prayer. Speaking yes, ma'am. You often counsel your members to be dignified in their response. Yes. To take the high ground. Did you step on that message by tearing up? No, I did not. Opinion? No, I did not. I tore up a manifesto of mistruths. It's very hard for us to get you to talk about the issues that we are working on, uh, HR 3, infrastructure and the rest. He misrepresented all of that was necessary to get the attention of the American people to say, this is not true, and this is how it affects you. And I don't need any lessons from anybody, especially the President of the United States, about dignity. Dignity. Is it okay to start saying four more years in the House of Representatives? It's just unheard of. Is it unheard of for the President to insult people there who don't share his view as well as to misrepresent, present falsehoods. Some would use the word lie. I don't like to use the word lie uh, about what he is saying. So, no, I think it was completely, entirely appropriate. And considering some of the other exuberances within me, the courteous thing to do. Yes, sir. I think if you pause, I know you'd like another president, but to invite them back for a State of the Union, given what you're describing. Well, next year we will have a new president of the United States. That is an absolute imperative for our country, for our Constitution, for the land that we love from sea to shining sea, which he degrades almost every day, but several times a week, uh, for who we are as a people, a nation of immigrants, unless you're blessed to be born a Native American, a nation of whom he denigrates, and for our values, which he just is disloyal to the Constitution, degrades the environment, um, uh, denigrates who we are as a people, and, and undervalues who we are as a great country that is a, good, that is a good country where people care about each other and where there's a sense of community. Uh, it's appalling, the things that he says, and then you say to me, uh, tearing up his falsehoods. Isn't that the wrong mess? No, it isn't. It's just I have tried to be gracious with him. I'm always dignified. I thought that was a very dignified act compared to my exuberance, as I said. Uh, but uh, uh, we will not allow any president to use that capital, that chamber of the House of Representatives, of the People's House, as a backdrop for him. Now, all presidents have guessed constant guest. That was not a state of the union. That was a state, his state of mind. We want a state of the union. Where are we? Where are we going? And the rest. Not let me just show you how many guests I can draw. And let me say how I can give a medal of honor. Do it in your own office. We don't come in your office and do congressional business. Why are you doing that here? Quite frankly, when he started talking about someone with stage four cancer, all of that, I thought he was... I don't know which stage uh, uh, John Lewis's cancer is at, but when he started talking about someone with cancer, we thought he was going to talk about John Lewis, a hero in our country. Come on. So in any event, I feel very liberated. I feel very liberated. I feel that uh, I've extended every possible courtesy. I've shown every level of respect. I say to my members all the time, there's no such thing as an eternal animosity. There are eternal friendships, but you never know on what uh, cause you may come together with somebody who may be perceived as your foe right now. Everybody is a possible ally 
and whatever comes next. E pluribus unum, from any one. They didn't know how many we'd be or how different we'd be, but they wanted us always to remember that we were one, and they, our founders, had their differences, uh, as do we. So again, I extended the hand of friendship to him, uh, to welcome him as the President of the United States, to the People's House. It was also an act of kindness, because I, he looked to me like he was a little sedated. He looked that way last year, too. So, but he didn't want to shake hands. That was that. That meant nothing to me. It had nothing to do with my tearing up. That, that came much later. In, you know, a speed reader. I just went right through that thing. So I knew what was coming when I saw the compilation of falsehoods. And, but then when I heard like the first quarter or third, I, then I started to think there has to be something uh, that clearly indicates the American people that this is not the truth. And uh, he has shredded the truth in his speech. He's shredding the Constitution in his conduct. I shredded his state of his mind address. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk about Thank the you. investigations going Thank forward? You. you were thinking about Rush Limbaugh being in the chamber. Mm -hmm. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. He's like, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. Who else was underage? All of them. All of them. He told me the younger the better. How did he get so rich? How did he get away with it for so long? And what do the women who survived his crimes now have to say? <laughs> Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Time for pop news with the little Spencer. Take Thank it away. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and we're going to begin with more Oscar news for you all. We are now just a few days away from the big night, and the Academy has just announced their last round of presenters. You guys ready? Yeah. Josh Gad is so great. Sandra O, oh, Natalie Portman, Chris Rock, all of whom have so much to say will help make this show amazing. The director of Jojo Rabbit will also be in that group. Also handing out the hardware, Tom Hanks. <laughs> its most searched for Oscar trends of 2020, topping the list of questions on the search engine. Who's hosting the 2020 Oscars? Who has won the most Oscars for acting? Has anyone named Oscar ever won an Oscar? <laughs> and when are the Oscars? Well, move over Google. As the host network, we have everything you need to know right here, right now. There is no 
host, hence the incredible list of stars contributing to the show that we've been sharing with you as the Academy shares with us. Thank you, Academy. Catherine Hepburn has the most Oscars with four total. Mm, wow. Songwriter Oscar Hammerstein, one oh. half of the musical duo Rodgers and Hammerstein, has won two Best Original Song Oscars, 1941 and 1945, in case you were wondering. And as for when the Oscars are happening, well, the 92nd Annual Academy Awards airs Sunday, February 9th, right here on ABC. <laughs> This morning, Viola Davis will play Michelle Obama in a new drama series called First Ladies. Yeah, Showtime has picked up this show that will peel back the curtain, they say, on the personal and political lives of First Ladies throughout history. Season one will focus on Eleanor Roosevelt, Betty Ford, and Michelle Obama. The show is being produced by Davis's production company. No details yet on who will play the other First Ladies, but Showtime is bullish on the series, saying throughout history, president spouses have wielded remarkable influence and not only with the nation's leaders but also on the country itself this comes as davis wraps up her run on the hit abc series how to get away with the Congratulations, Viola. And finally, we really want you guys to know this incredible person. Meet Lloyd Black, a 91-year-old retired school teacher from Alabama who just became the member of the month at the Anytime Fitness Center in Sims, Alabama. Congratulations, Lloyd. Here is his certificate which says that Lloyd joined a year ago at age 90 years young when he felt like his day-to-day -day chores were getting really hard for him. He knew he needed to gain strength and stamina. He's been a loyal gym goer ever since, hitting the weights three times a week. <laughs> Look at him. Nothing like working out overalls, you know? Well, <laughs> When he started, he could only do 10 minutes on the treadmill. Now he's on that treadmill for a half an hour, oh, three times a week. Great. As for his signature workout outfit, move over Lululemon, Lloyd says he wears overalls every time because they're comfortable and, quote, that's what I have. <laughs> the limelight, but he said if it helps others get started, he'll do it. Aww. Thank you, Lloyd. I that love was that. great. I love that. And thank, thank you. you. <laughs> We're going to turn now to our GMA cover story, Victoria's Secret under fire. The company facing new calls this morning to reform its workplace culture after a bombshell report detailing, detailing allegations of misogyny, bullying, and harassment by top executives. Amy is back with the latest on this story. Good morning again. Good morning, Cecilia. They're calling it a wake-up call for Victoria's Secret, a new letter from the advocacy group The Model Alliance and signed by 100 models who are ready to see the lingerie brand follow a new code of conduct. Look out, cause here I come. This morning, renewed calls for Victoria's Secret to take action to end alleged abuse and harassment within the company. An open letter signed by more than 100 models is urging the lingerie giant to take concrete steps to change its culture of misogyny and abuse, adding the time for listening is long past. The Model Alliance also calling on Victoria's Secret to join its respect program, which requires members to follow a code of conduct. We believe it is essential that people who are vulnerable can bring forward their concerns um, in, in a way that is safe and transparent. All this coming in the wake of a bombshell New York Times report exposing allegations of sexual misconduct and harassment within the retail giant. Victoria's Secret is also accused of retaliating against those who reported misconduct, including a former top female executive who was let go last fall. When they had tried to complain or when they had tried to usher in a different vision for the company, they were punished for it. Behind the scenes of the company's famous fashion shows, some insiders claiming there existed a toxic culture, allegedly led by former top executive Ed Razik. The Times investigation claiming Razik tried to kiss models, asked them to sit on his lap, and groped one woman before a fashion show in 2018. At least one model, Andy Muse, told the Times after rebuffing Razik's advances, Victoria's Secret stopped hiring her. In an email to ABC News, Razik said in part, the accusations in the Times story are categorically untrue, misconstrued, or taken out of context. 
Victoria's Secrets parent company, L Brands, saying we absolutely share a common goal with Model Alliance to ensure the safety and well-being of models and that they've already implemented elements of the RESPECT program and beyond. I think that this can be a wake-up call for Victoria's Secret, but it's also an opportunity to take models' concerns seriously. Now, the Model Alliance also said, quote, we are inviting Victoria's Secret to work with us. We're saying let's work together. Let's fix these problems. So that inclusiveness hopefully will result in something positive. positive. Yeah. So. yeah. Sure so. hope so. Thanks, All right. Amy. Thank you so much, Amy. And now to a shocking experiment showing how easy it is for online predators to target kids. Almost a third of teen girls say they received unwanted explicit images in 2018. So GMA went exclusively behind the scenes with a mom posing as an underage girl to educate parents on the dangers. TJ Holmes is here, and TJ, this is definitely something that families need to watch. I cannot sugarcoat this, Stray. What I saw was stomach turning and disturbing, and dare I say, you need to see it too. Parents, you've been warned for years about the dangers of online predators, but what this organization and this woman are now able to show us uniquely is the methods that predators use in real time to actually groom a child and we see how quickly they deploy those methods. You're watching as Sloan, a 37-year-old suburban mom, transforms herself to pose as an underage girl online. For her safety, we won't show you her face, we won't tell you her real name. What are you hoping parents are going to take from your work? Lots of parents might say, well, my kid would never post anything remotely salacious. What we've been able to demonstrate with these is that regardless of how innocuous content might be, they're still susceptible to being being targeted. Sloan is the head of a special research project at Bark, an online monitoring service that works with various schools and parents to track kids' social media use. Children are being methodically groomed. It's not just a random occurrence. No matter where your children are, predators are gonna go to. It's increased dramatically and we can't arrest our way out of our problem. GMA going behind the scenes with the Bark Special Projects team as they set up offsite. So we're gonna set dress these two rooms. Sloan and the team create online personas for an 11 year old and a 15 year old dressing up bedrooms, graphic artists taking photos and photoshopping Sloan, computers and phones set up with accounts on Instagram and Kick. It's uh, coffee cups, yeah. puppies, flowers, normal, just teen and tween expressions. The team goes live at 7 p.m. What usually happens? The testing the waters to the full-blown explicit content is astounding and it's stomach turning. Just about an hour after posting, Sloan checks 15-year-old Libby's kick account. You're giving him every opportunity to stop. We never want to get to the point where we're even towing the line of entrapment. And receives an explicit nude photo. I just imagine being a 15-year-old and not really knowing what's going on. It's, it's something that these people seem to really know how to exploit. Just a few minutes later on Instagram. Okay, tell me what's happening. He wants a live photo. A dare to send a selfie. Mind boggling. Then a request for a revealing photo. And later, a conversation turns explicit. What? Keep in mind, this teen is only posting innocent smiley emojis. Now, what happens on the 11-year-old accounts is even more disturbing. Someone claiming to be 26 sends a photo. Are you happy, pretty girl? Then texts, you owe me more, requesting a revealing photo from her. Sloan sends a non-explicit picture. What happened? He wants a replay. What? Because I did a disappearing image. So this time he'll be able to keep the image? That's right. And he's just, up to 10 messages you haven't even Just right in a, a row. Time. This language is really indicative of someone who's grooming. I don't want to share you. And so that is um, just really controlling language. And just as a reminder, he started talking to her half hour ago. So you're reminding him of your age. That's right. You're giving Yeah, him... I'm in sixth grade. But he's doubling down. Don't show anyone else, OK? Bark turns over reports of potential child predators to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We work with law enforcement 
to address these issues that are sometimes very urgent. I'm an adult and it's upsetting to me, it's traumatizing to me, and then I put myself in the shoes of an 11 year old that doesn't have the tools to cope, doesn't have someone to talk to, that's devastating. We all go to work and we have good days, we have bad days. What is a good day at work for you? If we can be a part of eradicating child sex abuse through awareness, making platforms safer, that's a good day at the office. Uh, okay, look, it's not specific to any one social media platform. It was Instagram and Kick here, and they say they refer all of these types of conversations to the proper folks. Uh, so it can be any platform. But what, what we saw, they, they start with, you're so pretty, yep. you should be a model. Do you take pictures? Do your parents let you have a boyfriend? Want me to be your Instagram? It starts, yeah. and it starts immediately. I watched as soon as a post goes up, here come the messages. So, and, and again, the, the young lady who was blurred out there, the next day I saw her, she was just in tears. This is overwhelming and emotional yeah. stuff to see what is happening to our children online. You gotta pay attention to your yes. kids' online accounts. You have to, have to keep the conversations going with your kids, know what they're doing, and don't let them have the phones in the bedroom at night yeah. will help a lot because that's yeah. when a lot of this happens. Yeah. Nice yeah. Day, TJ. Really wow. You got it, guys. You got it. Mm. Wow. More now on Kirk Douglas, the Hollywood star who dominated the screen for years. And you have more on this, Lara. I do, Robin. Kirk Douglas appeared on GMA so many times over the years. And this morning, we're opening up the GMA vault to hear what he said about success, failure, and staying on top in Hollywood. First of all, I'm a failure because I never intended to become a movie star. My aim in life was always to become a big star on the stage. So since I haven't succeeded in that, in a sense, I'm a failure. I mean, <laughs> coming in movies was a byproduct. I mean, the first time someone asked me to come, you know, to come out to test for a movie, I was shocked. And then I would, was always going back for several years, going back to Broadway, I'd do a flop, you know, and then come back and do movies. And then finally I started you know, doing movies, and I guess it, yeah, I guess the fact that, uh, you know, like a baseball player, you know, if you can last 10, 20, or in movies, 30 years, yeah, I guess that means you're, in, you're a movie actor. Returning to GMA in 1982, telling David Hartman about the experience of being a movie star. But you see, this is the nice feeling sometimes, because people who have seen you often in movies, it's a wonderful feeling when they greet you like they know you very well. And how he stayed on top in Hollywood. What's the secret of survival? Here you are, you have been working at the top, top of this business of yours for a lot of years, Kirk, and you keep doing it. In I think, uh, seriously, David, I think in any field, uh, if there is a secret, it's enthusiasm. As long as you enjoy doing what you're doing, Mm -hmm. The LA Times republished a column that Douglas wrote to celebrate his 60th wedding anniversary with his wife Anne. It's getting so much reaction. He wrote, when a friend asked him, Kirk, why did your marriage last so long? He replied, it's easy. I just told my wife, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. Oh, that sense of humor. It's a great read. I highly recommend oh, you check it out. Oh, gosh. Celebrated life. Yeah, very much so. Thank you for sharing that. We're on the road to the Oscars, a big show just three days away. GMA is helping you get star style for less. For less. The key word, for less. And for that, we have Tori Johnson. She is back with our Oscar edition deals and steals. And she brought some glamorous friends along, too. I did bring some of my friends. The stars with the sunglasses. Yes, yeah, sunglasses, or or you could be like Tom Hanks. And you oh. Could, yeah, you could, you could go the Tom Hanks style. So who's behind those Shop class. Yes, yeah, I feel like I'm in shop class. I'm getting ready to. <laughs> We've got readers, sunglasses. You, you can you can borrow yes. the stars' yes. styles, or you can create your own because we've got more than 50 options from Foster Grant. Mm -hmm. So you choose. You do you. I think sunglasses are that one classic, timeless, yeah. easiest accessory. And with Foster Grant, they're affordable. Normally, 21 to 36 dollars. Today, our assortment is slashed in half. It starts at 10.50. Oh, 
with Number mine. two, we're going to look Number right two. over there. Okay. We're going to look at these awesome star hairstyles. So we've got FHI. So if you can't have a glam team travel with you everywhere, you can get curls. You can get that silky blowout. You can get any kind of bounce that you want with these specific hair tools. That's what I'm I, looking for. That, <laughs> Perfect, I brought this just for you. Their untangle brush is one of the best because no pulling, no snagging. Okay. And so oftentimes when you do a lot of stuff to your hair, we need to be a little gentle on it. Mm -hmm. 15 to $300 regularly. Oh. Hair tools are pricey. Today at Slash and Have it starts at $750. Oh, okay. Then we're coming over here. Who was that man? Burgundy. Was the Why red carpet trend this? because you burgundy. started this trend a few years ago on the red carpet burgundy and that trend has extended not only to a tuxedo but more specifically for my purposes here Deborah Lippman is the manicurist to the stars yep. this yeah. color right here is called Miss Independent Ooh. Laura Dern wore this when she accepted we have a picture there her SAG award so forget her acting I would say that Miss Independent Laura Laura, uh, Deborah Littman, this is what gave Laura that good luck. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah. That? It's a good color, right? Yeah, it is. It's a nice color. I'm never, can I see that? No, I was like, you don't see it again. That's okay. I'm good with that. 19 to $99 because we have sets and assortments, oh. so much stuff. It's all slash and half. It starts at $9.50 and free, free shipping. <laughs> A couple of these. You're wearing a mix. couple. Yes. So mixing's always great. Um, let me tell you. You know what color you're wearing? No. Full throttle. Oh, oh full throttle. That's that is appropriate. <laughs> that is very appropriate. Elena uh -huh. is a huge fan she of this is, line. She, she asks me all the time, when is Stila coming back? So we've brought their whole lip collection. So whether you like matte, glossy, shiny, whatever it is, there's a lip for you. And bold lips, that's one of the things that you see on the red carpet. I can't wait to see the lips you guys are gonna have well, on the red get, carpet. Get a picture 15, Robin's lips. She wants to. Robin. <laughs> 15 to 24 regularly at Slash to have. You can get Robin's lips starting at 750. <laughs> to the one. This is the one hair care from Frederick Vakai, legendary Ooh. hairstylist. It smells so good. It smells so good and it's also for lots of different things. So whether you need volume, anti-frizz, whatever there is. <laughs> I know, there's so many different things. One of the things that I love are the masks yeah. because the masks are great for repair. So when you're just abusive to your hair, the masks are awesome. And what I love about this line is they make travel sizes yeah, or know. these gigantic full sizes. So whatever your specific needs, sometimes you've got great things only in one size. We've got you covered with all of this. Normally, $26 to $59. Today, it is slash and half. Starts at $13. Great. Wow. Great. Ready? 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 So, you see Lizzo up here. Oh. Lizzo is wearing Natalie Mills. These Diana Baguette earrings right here on Lizzo and, and somebody Lero. else and is wearing is them too. Wearing them. Wow. wow. So here's, bling, bling. here's something awesome. Nice. The stars can be sensible. Many stars, we think that it's all diamonds and the mm -hmm. real deal, but that means you gotta have security yep. and sort of all of that extra expense. Instead, you can get the look of luxury without breaking the bank. It look, nobody would know the difference. No, nobody would know the difference. Know. Wow. And these styles from that are really stunning. 35 to 65 regularly. So they're already affordably priced. Mm -hmm. Today, they're slashed up to 63%. Everything you see here, 14 to 32.50. And free shipping. That's right. Tori, thank you so much. As always, and we partner with all of these companies on these great deals. You can get them on our website. And our audience, you're not going home empty-handed. You're going home with items from Foster yeah. Grant. Still mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. 
and your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Ismail? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. We certainly do say good morning, America. A lot of smiles <laughs> around here this morning. We can feel it in here, people. We can feel it. Incredible. Stop. Woo! Big morning in Times Square. We're gonna celebrate. <laughs> you don't want to miss that. This is gonna be good. Ladies, are you ready? Michael. Sarah. Come on, Kiki. I'm gonna have some fun with this. Ah! We're gonna talk about the good. Yeah. Yeah. Right here in Times Square. This is amazing and it's funny. Yeah. I watch this show all the time. Oh, you know, we're We out here. Yeah. We out here. Central and Pacific on ABC. And that's a wrap. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast. An extraordinary moment for Amy Purdy, the Paralympian and former Dancing with the Stars contestant, taking her first steps after yet another life-threatening health scare. Kaylee Hartung was there for it all. Good morning, Kaylee. Good morning, Robin. The moment was extraordinary. There was so much emotion in the room, anticipation and anxiety, as Amy Purdy welcomed us in to share in this very private moment, the moment of truth. Could she take that first step? <sighs> All right, let's do it. This morning with GMA by her side, Paralympian Amy Purdy is facing one of her greatest challenges yet. Okay. The 40 year old walking for the first time in one year in brand new prosthetic legs. I thought I knew patients from what happened 20 years ago, but now I'm back to learning. The Paralympic snowboarding legend and show-stopping Dancing with the Stars alum, cha, cha, cha. who lost uh, both her legs uh, below the uh, knees uh, after contracting bacterial meningitis at just 19 years old, turned tragedy into triumph. But one year ago, she was diagnosed with yet another life-threatening medical blow. Oh my God. A massive vascular injury in her left leg, a blood clot stretching from her hip to the bottom of her left leg. I couldn't imagine not snowboarding again. I couldn't imagine not walking again. I couldn't accept it. Doctors initially telling her to treat the clot, she had two options, amputate what was left of her leg or have a procedure that could destroy her kidney, which she received as a transplant from her father to save her life 20 years ago. That was hard, <laughs> that was hard. I had a big choice to make. How close were you to dying? It, there was one doctor that said, you know, you could have died because you could have had a stroke like that. But I also know, you know, 20 years ago, I was dying. I know what it feels like to almost die. I was fighting for my life 20 years ago. This was, I was fighting for the quality of my life. But uncertainty bred fear for Amy and her husband, Daniel. This is the first time Daniel's really seen me just completely down and out with no idea if I'm gonna walk again. Yeah, I think that's probably been the most difficult part to it is the uncertainty. One year after that life-changing diagnosis, Amy credits her angel surgeon, Dr. Omar Mumbariks. What gave you the confidence other doctors didn't have that you could be creative and that you could find ways to help her? I just looked at her and I said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna take things outside the box. She's young and she's strong. She can handle the clot buster that we essentially put down there. Now, Amy is back on her own two feet. 
Don't look at us like we're amputees, we're already damaged. Like, look at us like we're humans. Amy already has the next goal on her incredible journey set. She plans to run in Japan in April. Robin, she has been asked to carry the torch towards the 2020 Tokyo Games. And you better believe she'll be ready to do it. <laughs> I have no doubt that's going to happen, Kaylee. You can hear the reaction from our audience here. Oh, my goodness. The community comes to terms with its past wrongs and tries to make it right. ABC's Will Carr has more. For more than four decades, the Douglas Tigers dominated opponents on the basketball court. Their pictures, spanning from the 1940s to the 1960s, show young teenagers with a true love for the game. While the images are black and white, the memories are far more murky. Douglas was a segregated all-black high school in Kingsport, Tennessee, a quiet town nestled into the Holston River that, at the time, was split by race, much like the rest of the country. In the South, Jim Crow laws mandated that blacks segregate themselves in public, many forced to drink out of separate water fountains and even eat in separate parts of restaurants. Well, there were a lot of places we couldn't go or there were things that we couldn't do. Movie theaters, we had to sit upstairs. We could not sit on the first floor. In the late 50s and early 60s, Maxie Dobbins Johnson played guard on the high school girls team, winning trophy after trophy. Competing against other all-black schools, the boys team even won a state championship before the school shut down in 1966. Many of their trophies disappeared. They were placed inside the pristine cases in Dobbins Bennett, the all-white high school across town. That big tall one was right here. That trophy stood out like a sore thumb. For decades, students and alumni assumed that trophy had been earned by white athletes during the segregation era. It was painful to see that. It was painful to walk by and know that it was just sitting there by itself. Calvin Sneed, the Douglas High School historian, discovered the mistake. Sneed then found dozens of the lost Douglas trophies stuffed in cardboard boxes inside a dusty closet on the Dobbins Bennett campus. Those trophies needed to come home. There were players, there, were, there was alumni that wanted to know what happened to our trophies, and to find them was a blessing. Then Chris Pohl, the current head coach of the Dobbins Bennett boys team, found out about the trophies and the athletes they really belonged to. Uh, the basketball team, they took hand-me-down jerseys from Dobbins Bennett, and they would dye them in their school colors. According to the old-timers, during games, that dye would bleed onto the court. Our guys couldn't fathom living in those times, and that just shows that we've come a long way. So the city pledged to remember the men and women who played for a school long forgotten. We realized that we had a very rich history in both our high schools. That history includes 94-year-old William Hickman. Does this guy look familiar? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> That's you. It says that you were the captain of the football team and the co-captain of the basketball team. Mm -hmm. What position did you play? Uh, forward. I never did score that many points, but I rebounded a lot. 93-year-old Richard Watterson, on the other hand, had a knack for the net. I remember making a lot of points. <laughs> you made a lot of points? <laughs> Did it feel special to you to be part of that team? We won, we won, we won. <laughs> Do you harbor any animosity against the people who discriminated against you? No, sir. Why is that? I worked through it. More than 70 years later, Watterson and all the other Douglas Tigers, some moving a little slower than they once did on the court, finally got the full recognition from their community they've always deserved. All invited to a trophy presentation at the Dobbins Bennett basketball games over the weekend. For one special night, the current players even traded in their normal gray and maroon jerseys for the original Douglas colors, sky blue and gold. Just as an African-American teacher and coach myself, uh, it helps me pay homage to uh, what, what those have come before us uh, have done. That acknowledgement scored big with the former Douglas players. A long time coming. <laughs> But I'm glad it has arrived. So it's just realizing that we are all valued, we are all important, 
and we all need to live together. I think that's great advice. <laughs> Today, more than 50 years after the Douglas Tigers won their last game, their accomplishments and the stories behind them are now on full display. The past has to be acknowledged. You can't know your history until you look back and see where you've come from. In Kingsport, Tennessee, Will Carr, ABC News. And we certainly do say good morning, America. Hit it, people. A lot of smiles around here this morning. We can feel it in here, people. We can feel it. Incredible. Stop. Build it up, build it up. We're going to celebrate. We got it all. <laughs> A big morning in Times Square. So much excitement. It feel good, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how I feel every morning. Oh, yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> Don't want to miss that. This is going to be good. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline, ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. And download the app now and sign up to get important breaking news alerts wherever you are. It's a number one true crime podcast. There was a murder in central Ohio. The man who committed that crime once sat on death row, but now he's on the run. His name is Lester Eubanks. Now, listen as U.S. Marshals give stunning access in the manhunt to catch a fugitive. Those nine lives are running out, and we're going to catch up with Lester. Follow the clues. Can you help U.S. Marshals catch this killer? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen free now on Apple Podcasts. Now with that exclusive look behind the scenes of the Academy Awards, let's take a look live at the red carpet where Hollywood's biggest stars will walk just three days from now. They roll it out yesterday, yeah. Chris Conley sat down with the producers and joins us now from Hollywood. Good morning, Chris. Hey, good morning from the Oscars, Robin. That's right, I'm here on the red carpet outside the Dolby Theater, as you can see. They're underway, getting preparations ready for the 92nd Academy Awards. Inside, the producers promising a tight, entertaining show where issues of inclusion will be addressed via presenters and performers. Backstage before this year's Academy Awards, a dazzling winner's walk awaits 2020's Oscar recipients, revealed by the show's producers. It means a lot to win an award, to win an Oscar here, so we're we're just happy to be part of that. Yeah, because I think ultimately there's just nothing like the Oscar, and, and it's it's been around for so long. And With the big show drawing near, Stephanie Elaine and Lynette Howell Taylor offering behind-the-scenes glimpses of Oscar preparations. What was um, it like seeing the set take shape? It was, it, was it was really thrilling. It was actually one of the most thrilling parts, and we both got emotional. We did. The first time we saw it up, there were tears. There were tears. They're promising major musical performances this year from such nominees as Elton John and from Oscar invitees Billie Eilish, fresh off her Grammy triumphs, and Janelle Monet. I think the show hopefully will feel, um, it'll have a good pace. I think it will feel theatrical. Yes. So there's, there's more Musical music numbers. moments. Yeah, yes. more music moments than they've had yes. in the show in recent years. What can we expect from those musical numbers? What will we see that will surprise or delight us, you think? Well, it wouldn't be a surprise if we told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what you'll see is a range. For the second year in a row, the Oscars will go without a host. Why was that the right decision? They moves the show faster. Yes. I think it, it keeps the pace up last year. And it puts the spotlight on the films and the yeah. filmmakers. Um, and it went great last year, so we thought we would build on that. Both of you in your work have always represented inclusion and diversity in terms of people making movies. What can you do with this show that will make a young director, a person of color, a woman feel like she has a place 
at the Hollywood Sandler. From the beginning, we always wanted the show to feel diverse and inclusive, and I think our choices in terms of what we can make a difference in, in terms of presenters and musical numbers, that's where you'll feel a great sense of, of, of inclusion. And, and, and 64 women were nominated this year for Absolutely, Oscars, and that's a record number. a huge number. record, and almost all of the Best Picture nominees were produced by women. Yeah. What kind of moments can you create on the stage that will make the next person like that feel like, I'm going to be up there next time? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, all kinds of excitement going on, and those producers burning the midnight oil to make this show happen. I asked if they were getting a lot of sleep. They said, not much. So, no sleep till Oscar out here. <laughs> Guys? Here either. I know. <laughs> we'll be joining you real soon with yeah, that. They weren't giving up anything. No, 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 but you tried your best, Chris. <laughs> yep. We'll see you soon. America Strong Millions saw him giving fist bumps to his heroes, and years later, it turns out, he's the champion. It was the moment six years ago seen by millions. Liam Fitzgerald waiting for his favorite team, the Boston Bruins. One by one, Liam giving them a fist bump, the moment going viral. And just like his beloved Bruins, Liam is a fighter. He has Down syndrome and has battled leukemia for years. Our partners at ESPN's E60 have followed Liam's journey. The practice is at home. Nice. Documenting Liam and his family at the Bruins games. Fans know him. <laughs> Liam's parents, Bill and Christine. He'd come so far, he'd battled so much, he hadn't lost his joy. He was given to us to raise, but he was given to the world to love. And I see that come out, and I see the Bruins love him, and he brings out the best in everyone. And tonight, all these years later, a milestone for Liam. He's in his first starting lineup for the Mellican Middle School basketball team in Northboro, Massachusetts. And about that famous fist bump. Do you do the fist bump before these games with the kids? Yes, I always do. To pump them up and win every game. Liam, number 11. <laughs> Liam is a manager on the team, and his coach says his hard work and dedication earned him the starting spot. And here he is, scoring the game's first points. Yeah! Nothing but net. The crowd cheering his name. Liam celebrating that basket at his other victory, now cancer-free for seven years. Wow, we are rooting for Liam. What a fighter. Nothing but net. When we think of Kobe Bryant, the public persona, there are certain images that come to mind. NBA champion, fearless competitor, Oscar winner, proud dad, but it's here at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery that a rarely seen side of Kobe hangs on display. The goal in our short time together was to catch a glimpse of what a quiet moment with Kobe Bryant might be. Kobe now shares space in the same building with portraits of U.S. presidents and first ladies and other iconic American figures. The National Portrait Gallery's mission is to tell the story of America through portraiture. And we have a long tradition of exhibiting the image of a significant individual when they have passed away. And it was a very quick decision that we would be putting Kobe Bryant's portrait up. Kobe's photo recently placed on the ground floor on the in memoriam wall is the first thing visitors see. And it's his expression that draws people in. In the photo, you see a level of vulnerability, the complexity of who he was. And I think there's a tendency with athletes and particularly African-American athletes to have them be one dimensional. Rick Chapman photographed Kobe as part of an ESPN-sponsored series featuring 25 great athletes. It was 2007 when we made that portrait together, and he came in with the most gorgeous suit with an orange tie, and he presented to me immediately that very contagious smile that you just know Kobe for. It started with the presentation of maybe what Kobe is supposed to do or thinks he's supposed to do. 
Kobe is notorious for controlling the narrative around him. You know, he was the one that came up with his own nickname, the Black Bamba. Did he have any input that day in terms of how he wanted to be seen? The input that he had was the beautiful suit and the orange tie. Beyond that, no, I got that first and then was lucky enough to have the time and space and the quiet to come to a calm. Hey, let's, all right, let's, let's move on from the suit. It was taking the shell away, taking away the performance and dropping into the human connection. Kobe Bryant is sort of seems to be you know, lost in thought and, and sort of gazing off in the distance. His fingers then sort of point you toward the very prominent tattoos on his arm. The depth of field in the photograph has Kobe slightly second in line to his wife's tattoo because that's what it was about. Who's the human? Who's the person off the basketball court? What is Kobe navigating in his life beyond scoring points? Now that we all collectively reflect on Kobe's life and his career, you realize that he was so much bigger, right, than basketball and sports in general. More than sports, more than basketball, Kobe takes his place as an American icon. Complex, multidimensional, fully human. The red carpet is ready for Hollywood's biggest night. The Oscars red carpet officially rolled out Wednesday, covering the asphalt on Hollywood Boulevard in front of the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles. Crews are putting the finishing touches on scaffolding and bleachers, and producers announced the final batch of presenters, which will include nominee Tom Hanks, former host Chris Rock, and Killing Eve star Sandra Oh. And remember, no host for Sunday's show. Hey, Jojo, my old friend. One of the movies that could surprise people with some wins Sunday is Jojo Rabbit. It's up for six Oscars, including Best Filmed, and while it's not the front runner, it could be a spoiler in some categories. Taika Waititi directed the World War II dramedy, and he also plays Hitler. And he tells us he wanted to tell this story because there are startling statistics when it comes to young people's knowledge about the Holocaust. It's extremely important to keep telling these stories. So we this is an ABC News special report. Now reporting, Tom Youngs. And good afternoon. We are coming on the air with breaking news. President Trump is about to be in front of the cameras at the White House responding to his acquittal in the Senate impeachment trial. You are looking live right now at the East Room where the, the president's White House legal team just entered to a standing ovation. We know many of the members right now in the East Room are Republican senators, vocal supporters of the president, TV news anchors that have supported the president. And as we listen to the music the president's about to enter, let's listen in. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Wow. We've all been through a lot together, and uh, we probably deserve that hand for all of us because uh, it's been a very unfair situation. Uh, I invited some of our very good friends, and we have limited room, but everybody wanted to come. We kept it down to a minimum. 
And believe it or not, this is a minimum. Uh, but a tremendous thing was done over the last number of months. But really, if you go back to it over the last number of years, we had the witch hunt. It started from the day we came down the elevator, myself and our future First Lady, who's with us right now. Thank you, Melania. And it never really stopped. Uh, we've been going through this now for over three years. Uh, it was evil. It was corrupt. It was dirty cops. Uh, it was leakers and liars. And this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. I don't know that other presidents would have been able to take it. Some people said no, they wouldn't have. But I can tell you, at a minimum, uh, you have to focus on this because it can get away very quickly, no matter who you have with you, it can get away very quickly. It was a disgrace. Uh, had I not fired James Comey, who was a disaster, by the way, uh, it's possible I wouldn't even be standing here right now. We caught him in the act. Dirty cops, bad people. If this happened to President Obama, a lot of people would have been in jail for a long time already, many, many years. Uh, I want to start by thanking some of, and I call them friends, because, you know, you develop friendships and relationships when you're in battle and war, much more so than, gee, let's have a normal situation. With all that we've gone through, we've done, I think, more than any president and administration. And really, I say, for the most part, Republican congressmen, congresswomen, and Republican senators. We've done more than any administration in the first few years. You look at all of the things we've done. I watched uh, this morning as they tried to take credit for the stock market from, from, think of that. Let me tell you, if we didn't win, the stock market would have crashed. And the market was going up a lot before the election because it was looking like we had a good chance to win. And then it went up tremendously from the time we won the election till the time we took office, uh, which was November 8th to January 20th. And that's our credit. That's all our credit. And leading up to that point was our credit because there was hope. And one of the reasons the stock market's gone up so much in the last few days is people think we're doing so well. They liked the State of the Union speech. It really is. It's a true honor to give it. Uh, making the State of the Union speech, I was with some people that have been around. They've been all over the world. And one of them said, highly sophisticated person, said, you know, no matter where you go in the world, it doesn't make any difference. There is nothing like what I witnessed tonight. The beauty, the majesty of the chamber, uh, the power of the United States, the power of the people in this room. A really an amazing evening. I don't think there is anything like that anywhere in the world. You can go to any other country. You can go to any other location, any other place. It's the beauty of everything. It's what it represents and how it represents our country. I want to start by introducing some of the people that are here. I know some are going to be left out, but they work so hard. And this is really not a news conference. It's not a speech. It's not anything. It's just we're sort of, uh, it's a celebration because we have something that just worked out. I mean, it worked out. We went through hell unfairly, did nothing wrong, did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. So 
John. You can take that home, honey. Maybe we'll frame it. It's the only good headline I've ever had in the Washington Post. I tell you. But every paper is the same. Does anybody have those papers? Does anybody have them? Because they're really you know, like that, so I appreciate that. Uh, but some of the people here have been incredible warriors. They're warriors. And there's nothing from a legal standpoint. This is a political thing. And every time I'd say, this is unfair, let's go to court, they say, sir, you can't go to court. This is politics. And we were treated unbelievably unfairly. And you have to understand, uh, we first went through Russia, Russia, Russia. It was all bullshit. <laughs> we then went through the Mueller report. And they should have come back one day later. They didn't. They came back two years later, after lives were ruined, after people went bankrupt, after people lost all their money. People came to Washington to help other people. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I say. They came, one or two or three people in particular, but many people. We had a rough campaign. It was nasty. It was one of the nastiest, they say. They say, Andrew Jackson was always the nastiest campaign. Uh, they actually said, we topped it. It was a nasty, it was a nasty, both in the primaries and in the, in the election. But you see, we thought after the election it would stop, but it didn't stop. It just started. And oh, tremendous corruption. Tremendous corruption. So we had a campaign. Little did we know we were running against some very, very bad and evil people with fake dossiers with all of these horrible, dirty cops that took these dossiers and did bad things. They knew all about it. The FISA courts should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, it's a very tough thing. And then we ended up winning on Russia, Russia, Russia. It should have taken the one day, as I said, and it took years. Then Bob Mueller testified. <laughs> That didn't work out so well for the other side. <laughs> but they should have said that first week, because it came out. Is that right, Jim Jordan? They knew in the first two days, actually. Devin, is that right? Two days. They knew that we were totally innocent. But they kept it going, Mark. They kept it going forever. Because they wanted to inflict political pain on somebody that had just won an election that, to a lot of people, was surprised. I mean, we had polls that said we were going to win. We had Los Angeles Times, and a few, a few papers actually said it was we were going to win, but it was going to be close. And uh, we did win. It was one of the greatest wins of all time. And they said, OK, he won. And you know, I wrote this down because that was where a thing called the insurance policy, to me, when I saw the insurance policy, and that was done long before the election, that was done when they thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And by the way, Hillary Clinton and the DNC paid for millions, millions of dollars, the fake dossier. And now Christopher Steele admits that it's a fake because he got sued by rich people I should have sued him, too. But when you're president, people don't like suing. I want to thank my legal team, by the way, not for that advice, but for <laughs> other advice. <laughs> Pat, Jay, Pat, you guys stand up. Please. Great job. Right at the beginning, they said, sir, you have nothing to worry about. All of the facts are on your side. I said, you don't understand. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And that was really true. They made up facts. A corrupt politician named Adam Schiff made up my statement to the Ukrainian president. He brought it out of thin air, just made it up. They say he's a screenwriter, a failed screenwriter. He tried to go to, unfortunately, he went into politics after that. <laughs> Remember, he said the statement, which is a mob statement. Don't call me, I'll call you. I didn't say that. 
Fortunately, for all of us here today and for our country, we had transcripts. We had transcribers, professional transcribers. Then they said, oh, well, maybe the transcription is, is not correct. But Lieutenant Colonel Vidbin and his twin brother, right? We had some people that, really amazing. But we did everything. We said, what's wrong with it? Well, they didn't add this word or that. It didn't matter. I said, add it. They're probably wrong, but add it. So now everyone agrees that they were perfectly accurate. When you read those transcripts, Tim Scott, I don't know if Tim's here, but he said, sir, he's the first one to call me, sir, I read the transcript. You did nothing wrong. And Mitch, he stayed there right from the beginning. He never changed. And Mitch McConnell, I want to tell you, you did a fantastic job. Somebody said, you know, Mitch is quiet. And I said, he's not quiet. <laughs> he's not quiet. These are the people. He doesn't want people to know him. And they said, is Mitch smart? I said, well, let's put it this way. For many, many years, a lot of very smart, bad in many cases, sometimes good, but people have been trying to take his place and to the best of my knowledge, I've never even heard the subject come up because they've been wiped out so fast. <laughs> this guy is great, and I appreciate it, Mitch. And he's also given us 191 now. 191 federal judges, two Supreme Court judges, right? We're up to 191. Yeah. Great guy. Great guy. He's a tough guy to read. I'm good at reading people. Tough guy to read, I'd call him. My wife would say, how'd you do with Mitch? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's what makes him good, when you can read somebody. <laughs> Fantastic job. And he understood right from this was crooked politics. This was crooked politics. How about all these people? They're running for office. They're saying the worst things about me, like eight senators on the Democrat side. Most of them got wiped out. You know, they got their 1% or less. Most of them got less. They decided to go home. Let's go back to California. Let's go back to wherever they came from. Let's go back to New York. How about that one? Our New York Senator, Gillibrand. Let's go back to New York after they get nothing. And then they take an oath that they will be fair, that they will be reasonable, you know, all of the different things that they had to sign. They're not fair, but here's the beauty. So we have four left. They're saying the most horrendous things about me. It's okay, it's politics. And then they're supposed to vote on me. They're trying to replace me, and then they're supposed to be voting. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's incredible. But so Mitch, I want to thank you very much, incredible. And you have some of your folks here. And uh, they're incredible people, and they've been right from the beginning. And again, you're out of session, unfortunately. I didn't, you know, I only told these folks, let's do this today. We did a prayer breakfast this morning, and I thought that was really good. In fact, that was so good it might wipe this out. But by the end, by the time we finish, this will wipe that one out, those statements. <laughs> I had, uh, I had Nancy Pelosi sitting four seats away, and I'm saying things that a lot of people wouldn't have said, but I meant every, <laughs> I meant every word of it. But we have uh, some of the folks that are going to be leaving right after this, and they work hard, and they did work hard. Uh, Bill Cassidy, Senator. Stand up, Bill. What a guy. Great man, when I need to know about health insurance and pre existing conditions and individual mandates, I call Bill or I call Barrasso. We get those two guys, they know more than anybody. Uh, a man who just became a senator, he's a little bit like me. We have a couple of them. Very successful guy in business, and he said, What the hell? I'll run for the Senate from Indiana. 
And he ran, and I saw him on television destroying his opponent in a debate. I said, you know, this guy could win, and I got behind him. And Mike Braun, you have done some great job. Thank you very much. Tough. Tough. Thank you. A man who got James Comey to choke. And he was just talking in his regular voice. He is the roughest man. He's actually an unbelievable, and I appreciate the letter you sent me today. I just got it. But he's got this voice that scares people. <laughs> you know, people from Iowa can be very tough. We're doing very well in Iowa. But I'll tell you, Chuck Grassley, he's looking at Comey. Well, you tell me, what did you say? <laughs> now, he wasn't being rough. That was just the way he talked. <laughs> And that was when Comey, I think that was when Comey announced that he was leaking, <laughs> lying, and everything else, right? He choked because he never heard anybody talk like that. <laughs> you know, you should have gone, if, I wish you got angry. You could have gotten the whole ball game. He would have said, I give up. Chuck Grassley is an incredible guy. And a man who, uh, you know, he was running against a tough, smart campaigner. We learned out how good she was, right? She was a great campaigner. In fact, by the end of the campaign, she was actually, I thought she was more for me than you were, Josh. I was worried. <laughs> I saw her ad. She was saying the greatest things about me. And you know who I'm talking about? And I went to a great place, Missouri. And I said, who do you have to beat her? And they said, well, we have four people. I said, let me see them. I got to interview people. Can you imagine? I'm interviewing people for the United States Senate. This is what I do. Where have I gone? But I love it. I love it because we're getting great people. The first one I met was Josh Hawley. After about 10 minutes, I said to the people, don't show me anybody else. This is the guy. <laughs> He was the attorney general, did a phenomenal job in the state, highly respected. And Claire McCaskill. So the theory was you couldn't beat her. Great campaign. I remember the last campaign she was going to be taken out. She was always going to be taken out, and she wins. And people say, how did that happen? Didn't happen with him. But she got so friendly toward me. In fact, one of the ads I still have, I'm putting it in the archives, is one of the best ads I've ever made. And she tried to convince people that we were best friends. But Josh ended up winning by five or six points. You were unbelievable. You were tough. And you are something. And one of the greatest supporters on the impeachment hoax was Josh Hawley. He was incensed, actually. I watched him. He was incensed at what they were doing and what they were saying. And those were the ones. You know, I had some that said, oh, I wish he didn't make the call. And that's OK. If they need that, it's, it's incorrect. It's totally incorrect. And then you have some that used religion as a crutch. They never used it before. An article written today, never heard him use it before. But today, you know, it's one of those things. But, you know, it's a failed presidential candidate, so things can happen when you fail so badly running for president. But Josh Hawley, I want to thank you. You were right from the beginning. Man, did I make a good choice. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Tremendous future. A man who is brilliant and who actually was deceived to an extent. It comes from a great state, Utah, where my poll numbers have gone through the roof. And one of the senators' poll numbers, and not this one, went down big. You saw that? You saw that, Mike? But Mike Lee is a brilliant guy. He's difficult. <laughs> Whenever I sign bills, you know, we do sign a lot of legislation that's it's big and it's powerful, but it's sort of everybody has to approve it. And I see 99 to 1. 99 to 1. I say, don't tell me who's the one. Is it Mike? Yes. <laughs> and he always has a good reason for it, too, by the way. But he is, he's incredible. And right at the beginning, he knew we were right, Mike. And I appreciate it very much. You're just fantastic. And say hello to the people of Utah. 
and tell him, I'm sorry about Mitt Romney. I'm sorry. Okay? We can say that Mike Lee is by far the most popular senator from the state. But you've done a fantastic job, Mike, in many ways. In many ways. A young woman who I didn't know at all, but she's been so supportive, and I've had great support from other people in that state, and she's been so supportive, and she's been downright nasty and mean about the unfairness to the president. And Kelly Loeffler, I appreciate very much. Thank you. Great. She saw it very early on. And we have, uh, I don't know if we have other senators here, but we got a hell of a lot of congressmen. I'll go over them quickly, but they have, they have also been, uh, you know, it helped when we won 197 to nothing. That's got to be a first, Kevin, right? Is that like a first? The Republicans have this image. See, I say Democrats are lousy politicians because they have lousy policy. Open borders, sanctuary cities, they have horrible policy. Who the hell can win? Oh, the new policy is raise taxes. They want to raise taxes. You know, all my life I wasn't in politics, but I'd say, if you're a politician, you want to say, we're going to lower taxes. They want to raise taxes. So they have open borders, sanctuary cities, raise everybody's taxes. Get rid of everybody's health care, 180 million people in the United States, and they're really happy. And we're going to give you a health care that's going to cost more money than the country could make in 30 years if it really does well. That's one year. So I've always said they're lousy politicians, but they do two things. They're vicious and mean. Vicious. These people are vicious. Adam Schiff is a vicious, horrible person. Nancy Pelosi is a horrible person. And she wanted to impeach a long time ago when she said, I pray for the president. I pray for the president. She doesn't pray. She may pray, but she prays for the opposite. <laughs> but I doubt she prays at all. And these are vicious people. But they do two things. They stick together. Historically, I'm not talking now. They stick together like glue. That's how they impeached, because they had whatever the number is, 220 people. So if they don't lose anybody, they'll be able to impeach anybody. You could be George Washington. You could have just won the war. And they say, let's get him out of office. And they stuck together, and they're vicious as hell. And they'll probably come back for more, but maybe not, because the Republican Party's poll numbers, Mitch, have now gone up more than any time, I think, since 2004, 2005. And you know what happened then? But in normal times, decades, you would call it. That was a little unusual time. It was for a very short period. Uh, the Republican Party, Party's poll numbers and Donald Trump's poll numbers are the highest I've ever had them. So maybe they will. It's no way to get your poll numbers up. It's not worth it. Because from my family standpoint, it's been very unfair for my family. It's been very unfair to the country. Think of it. A phone call. A very good phone call. I know bad phone calls. This is a phone call where many people, I think Mike Pompeo was probably on the call. Where's Mike? Mike Pompeo was on the call. Uh, many people were on the call. I know that many people. They even have a apprenti, bringing up an old favorite word of mine, the apprentice. They have apprenti. They have people on these calls. And I know there are many, when I speak to the head of a nation, and they have many people on. I mean, also, do you think they're just, in the case of Ukraine, he's a new president. He seems like a very nice person, by the way. His whole thing was corruption. He's going to stop corruption. We even have a treaty, 2001, 1999. It's a treaty, signed treaty, that we will work together to root out corruption in Ukraine. I probably have a legal obligation, Mr. Attorney, to report corruption. But they don't think it's corrupt when a son that made no money, that got thrown out of the military, that had no money at all, is working for $3 million up front, 83000 a month, and that's only Ukraine. Then goes to China, picks up $1.5 billion. Then goes to Romania, I hear, and many other countries. They think that's okay. 
Because if it is, is Ivanka in the audience? Is Ivanka? Boy, my kids could make a fortune. I think they could make a fortune. It's corrupt. But it's not even that. It's just general corruption. And the other thing is mentioned in the call, and something that I've told Mike Pence, our great vice president, I would tell him all the time. And I told him when he went on the trip, because he was over there. He never mentioned anything about this when you had your meeting. It's a terrible thing. But I told Mike, I said, Mike, we're giving them money. And, you know, you're always talking about that, because we have our country to build, we have our cities to build, and our roads to fix. But we're giving them money. Tell me, why isn't Germany paying money? Why isn't France? Why isn't United Kingdom paying money? Why aren't they paying money? Why are we paying the money? Is that a correct statement, Mike? I say, find out what the hell's going on. And I told that to all of my people, OMB. I said, I asked that question. How much is Germany paying? Why isn't Germany paying? Why is the United States always the sucker? Because we're a bunch of suckers. But that's turning around fast. But it makes it harder when stuff like this happens. Because you want to focus. And you want to focus perfectly. Think what we could have done if the same energy was put into infrastructure, prescription drug prices. Think of what we could have done. And I'm now talking both sides. Think of what we could have done if we had the same genius, because it's genius. I will say, it's genius on the other side. Maybe even more so, because they took nothing and brought me to a final vote of impeachment. That's a very ugly word to me. It's a very dark word, very ugly. They took nothing. They took a phone call that was a totally appropriate call. I call it a perfect call, because it was. And they brought me to the final stages of impeachment. But now we have that gorgeous word. I never thought a word would sound so good. It's called total acquittal. <laughs> total acquittal. So, so I want to, uh, if I could real fast, just introduce a few of the people. I have to start with, uh, I have to start with Kevin. Man, did you do a job. Lucky you're there. Lucky you're there because it wouldn't have worked out. If you don't have the right people, I tell you, Kevin McCarthy has done an incredible job. <laughs> and he loves his job, and he loves his country. Tell you what, Mitch and Kevin, they love what they do. Now, Mitch wouldn't even tell you he liked it. <laughs> Say, Mitch, do you like it? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> it's, he's the greatest poker player, right? Kevin will say, I love it, right? And I will say that uh, you're going to be Speaker of the House because of this impeachment hoax. I really believe it. I really believe it. And I'm going to work hard on it. I'm going to try and get out to those Trump, those Trump areas that we won by a lot. And, you know, in 18, we didn't win. We just won two seats in North Carolina, two wonderful seats in North Carolina that were not supposed to be won. But I went and I made speeches, and we had rallies, and we did a great job, and we won. We took two seats. Nobody writes about that. If we lost them, it would have been the biggest story of the year. But uh, we're going to go. We're going to do a job, and we're going to win a lot of seats. We're going to win a lot of seats. People are very angry that Nancy Pelosi and all of these guys, I mean, Nadler, I know him much of my life. He's fought me in New York for 25 years. I always beat him. And I had to beat him another time. And I'll probably have to beat him again. Because if they find that I happen to walk across the street and maybe go against the light or something, <laughs> let's impeach him. <laughs> so we'll probably have to do it again, because these people have gone Stone cold crazy, but I've beaten them all my life, and I'll beat them again if I have to. But what they're doing is very unfair. Very unfair. So Kevin McCarthy has been great. So a few names, right? And there'll be a few you forget. If you want, you can raise, and I'll say, great, love to have you, wonderful. 
But we're going to do the best we can. And I have my cabinet, but my cabinet's different. I appoint them, okay? I didn't see all of them helping so much. You know, they were running their, their various bureaucracies, right? Now, my cabinet's great, and they're all here. But today is the day to celebrate these great warriors, right? These are great warriors. They really fought hard for us. And so I'll start Kelly Armstrong, North Dakota. Kelly, thank you. Great job. Great job. Jim Banks of Indiana. Jim, thank you. Great job. Andy Biggs. Where's Andy? Boy, oh boy, Andy. He got. There's a guy. He's tough. I hear we're doing well in Arizona, huh? It's going good, yeah? I think so. I think I saw a poll that was very good. For me, I think we have to make sure Martha's going to do. I think Martha's going to do good. But we have some states that are going to be uh, not easy. But Arizona's been great. And we're stopping illegal aliens from coming in. We're putting up walls. New Mexico, too, a state that's never been in play for Republicans, is totally in play, right? Nevada's really looking good. We're, we're doing well. We're doing well. We're going to have a great. There's more spirit. I will say this. There's more spirit now for the Republican Party, by far, than the Democrats. You know, Mike Pence just got back from a place, a beautiful place, that Chuck Grassley knows well. Iowa. And he was talking about this fiasco, the Democrats. They can't count some simple votes, and yet they want to take over your health care system. Think of that. No, think of that. But we also had an election out there, and we got 98 percent of the vote. We have two people running, you know, and I guess they consider them non-people. But they are running. I mean, one was a governor. One was a congressman. They're running. We've got 98 percent of the vote. And everybody from the media was saying, who are those crowds over there? You know, they expect it to be one of these competitive where everybody's running because they want to win, they want to win. And it was Trump, right, Mark Meadows? It was Trump. This was a Trump crowd. And a lot of, actually, a lot of my guys went there. They went to Iowa. And a lot of friends went there. And we had tremendous, uh, they say the spirit. The spirit for the Republican Party right now is stronger, I think, than it's ever been in the history of our country. I think it's stronger than it's ever been. And that includes honest Abe Lincoln. You know, a lot of people forget Abe Lincoln. I wish he were here. I'd give him one hell of an introduction. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was a Republican. <laughs> Abe Lincoln, honest Abe. Bradley Byrne, Alabama. What a great place. Thank you, Bradley. A man who has been a, an unbelievable friend of mine and spokesman and somebody that that I really like. And I know, Kelly, you're going to end up liking him a lot. Something's going to happen that's going to be very good. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. But Doug Collins, where is he? Where is Doug? You have been so great. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Really amazing job. A young man who is born with a great gene, because I know his father and how great a politician he was, but uh, he's from Florida, sometimes controversial, but actually he's not controversial. He's solid as a rock, and he's a friend of mine, Matt Gates. Matt, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Great job. All right, this guy. So he's the NCAA, meaning a couple of years ago when he was in college, wrestling champion. NCAA, that's the big deal. That means in all of college, you're the champ. You're the best. His record was ridiculous. Nobody would, nobody could beat him. And I see it. You know, every time I see it, when I first got to know him, Jim Jordan, when I first got to know Jim, I said, uh, huh, he never wears a jacket. <laughs> what the hell's going on? He's obviously very proud of his body. <laughs> And they say where he works out, you know, with the congressmen, senators, they work at, they say when Jim works out, even though he's not as young as he was, but they, he works out, the machine starts burning down. You know, it's just a different form of a workout than us. Right, Sonny? And there he is. Look at that guy. But one day I'm looking, and he looks tough. And I'm looking, and I'm looking at those ears. 
And I say, those ears have something going on there. I said, did you ever wrestle? Yeah, I did. But he doesn't talk. But I checked. This guy was a world, this guy was a champion, top, top wrestler. And when I had the top, I had all of the teams. And by the way, uh, your Super Bowl champions are coming, I think, next week or soon, very soon. And they, every one of them want to be here. And the coach loves us. The coach is great, Andy Reid. And uh, every one of them want to be here. Uh, we have uh, people love it. But we had all of the NCAA championship teams here. They had the golf, the basketball. The, they had every team here. And one of the teams was wrestling. The wrestling team was that Penn State. And Penn State won the title. They have a great team. And I walked up with Jim, and it's like I didn't exist. <laughs> Those wrestlers, they grabbed him. They love Jim Jordan, and we love you, too, because you are some warrior. Yeah. Yeah. A woman who uh, became a star. We have a couple of women that became stars, you two. And uh, I always liked the name of her. You know, I like the name, Lesko. I liked it. That's how I picked it. I liked the name. I saw that face. I saw that everything. They gave me cards. He had like seven opponents, right? And you have no idea how much the public appreciates how smart, how sharp you are. This I can't tell. I can't tell. They just said, you know, she's really good. She's really talented. And I said, let's go. We worked with her. She won her race. Tough race. It's no longer tough because what she does out there is, is incredible. Arizona loves her. But you were so incredible representing, I don't say me, representing our country and getting it out of this impeachment hoax. What you did was incredible. So Debbie, please stand up. Debbie, let's go. A man who I, I became very friendly with. I don't know why. Do you ever have where, I'll ask the media, certain people call, you take their calls. Other people call, if they don't have information, they won't take anybody's call. But other people call, and you don't. This is a guy, he just, he's just a very special guy. His wife, I actually like better than him, to be honest. Because <laughs> he doesn't know that I know that he didn't actually support me right from the beginning, but she did. <laughs> and on my worst day, right? On my worst day, my worst, I won't tell you why it was my worst, but it was not one of those good days. She got on a bus, got many other buses, and women all over North Carolina, and they toured North Carolina. Well, Mark was back sort of semi-supporting another candidate, which he ended up leaving very quickly. I don't think you had a choice because of your wife. But thank her, and Mark Meadows, He's an extraordinary guy. I mean, the only problem is, I guess, he's announcing he'd, he'd only win by 40 points, but he's announcing that he'll be uh, not running this time. Do you have somebody good to run? Somebody going to win your district by at least 20 points, please? Okay. But he's a tremendously talented man, not just as a politician. As a human being, he's incredible. And, and during these horrible times, I mean, the way he worked, and Jim, and all of you guys, the way they worked was so, it was like their life was at stake. So many. Ron DeSantis is another one. He worked so hard. Then he called me, he said, sir, I'd like to run for governor. He said, governor? I don't want you to run. I like you staying. No, I want to run for governor. And I said, well, if you have to, I'd like your support. I said, how can I support you? You're three. He was at three, he had no money. Somebody else was at 38, and they had 22 million cash, right? I said, look, if it's important, I'll do it, because he's, he's been another great warrior. And he's, by the way, he ran, I endorsed him. His numbers went through the roof. The man who he beat, who was expected to win easily, called me after the race. He said, you endorsed him, and it was like a nuclear bomb went off. There was nothing I could do. He never even spent his money. He saved it. But Ron DeSantis is another one. And now he's the governor of Florida. And by the way, he's a great governor. He's a very popular governor. His numbers are in the 70s. And he's done a great job. But Mark, I want to thank you very much. Fantastic job. Thank you very much. Mark Meadows.
And Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Where's Mike? Central Casting, what a job. You can represent me anytime. You can represent me anytime. Thank you. What a job you've done. Thank you, Mike. And a man nobody's ever heard of except the other side. He's the other side's worst nightmare. This guy goes down into dungeons and basements. He'll find a document no matter what. He's the most legitimate human being. He's the hardest worker. He's unbelievable. He took tremendous abuse. I mean, abuse. The, the, the media and, you know, the other side and the bad ones, the leakers, the liars, the dirty cops, they wanted to destroy him. They tried. They got close, but he wouldn't let it happen. And honestly, in a certain way, he was the first one. Wouldn't you say Jim and Mark and everything? This was the first guy. He came out of nowhere. He's saying, these people are corrupt. He's still saying it. And he was unbelievable. Devin Nunes, he was unbelievable. <laughs> That's so true, Devin. He'd come in and say, I didn't even know him. I just heard there were like, there was this congressman who kept going into a basement, into files. He knew something was wrong. You felt it, right? And now we know a lot more than we knew then, right? You never thought it was as bad as it is. And hopefully we're gonna take care of things because we can never, ever allow this to happen again. Scott Perry of Pennsylvania. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Really great. And you're doing very well over there, by the way. Just so your numbers. A man who is a, a I mean, central casting. If I'm going to pick Perry Mason, I'm going to do a remake of Perry Mason. Other than Bill Barr, I picked this guy, but I have to say, I pick Barr. I pick Barr first, right? John Ratliff, right? But I have to tell you, if we're doing a remake, of Perry Mason, the man I get. There's nobody in Hollywood like this. John Ratliff. <laughs> right? Stand up, John. So, such a great lawyer. Incredible guy, incredible talent, but just a great lawyer, and we appreciate it. He gets on that screen, and everyone says, I agree. The other side folds up so fast. We'll probably be using a lot of you in the next year. But you have been fantastic, John. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. A man who's braver than me and braver than all of us in this room, he got, he got whacked. He got whacked. My Steve, right? I went to the hospital with our great first lady that night. Right, honey? And we saw a man that was not going to make it. He was not going to make it. He was the doctor. And I told him, his wife, I said, she loves you. Why do you say that? Because she was devastated. A lot of wives wouldn't give a damn. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of wives, a lot of wives would have said, hey, yeah. I said, how's he doing? Oh, she couldn't even talk. She was inconsolable. Most wives would say, not good. Uh, listen, I'm going home now. <laughs> but the doctor came in. The wife is like, she was a total mess. She was really devastated. And it really looked like he had a 20, 25 percent chance. I think you said a record for blood loss. And Steve Scalise, I actually, honestly, I think you're better looking now. You're more handsome now. You, you weren't that good looking. You look good now. He looks better now. Can you believe it? I don't know what the hell that is. Sure. Better now. What a guy. And he was practicing. He was practicing for the baseball game against, I guess, the Democrats, right? And this whack job started shooting. Hurt Rogers. I don't know if Rogers here. But hurt a number of people. Hit him. But really hit Steve. Steve was at second base. He was the second baseman. And he went down, and, and it was terrible. I mean, I saw the whole thing, and it was terrible. And fortunately, you had two brave policemen with you because of your high position in Congress. You had two policemen, and they were amazing. 
the man and the woman. And they came, and they didn't have rifles. They were against a supposedly pretty good sharpshooter with rifles, good equipment, and all they had was a gun. And they started coming in from the outfield shooting. And they're so far away that a handgun is not uh, preferred. And this guy has the rifle, and he's hitting people. And he was going to move up, and there was no out. I mean, if he would have been able to move up, there was no way to get out. The entrance was a single entrance way on the other side where he was. So everyone went into the dugout, ran into the dugout. But Steve was really hit badly in the stomach. And uh, with a bullet that rips you apart, it was supposed to do that. It rips, it rips you apart. And these two people came charging forward. Boom, boom, boom. And one of them, you know who? One of them, him, got the shooter, hit him and then got him, killed him from long distance. It was amazing. If you didn't have those two people, you can imagine, right? You, you can imagine what would happen. So uh, Milani and I went to the hospital that night, and he was in such bad shape, and he's been working ever since so hard. But six months ago, they had a baseball game at the National Spark, and I'm watching. And it's, it's on television. And it's just, you know, game people, you want to win it, right? And Steve's at second base. The poor guy can't even walk. Do you remember Bobby Richardson for the New York Yankees? He was known for range, Louie. Range. He had the greatest range. If a ball's hit the shortstop, Bobby Richardson's the second player, second baseman. Bobby Richardson would field the ball. If it's hit the first base, he'll throw it to the first baseman. He had unbelievable range. This was not Steve Skelly's. <laughs> Steve had no range. One foot, and he has to fall down, right? Because, you know, he was trying to get better. I don't know who the hell put you on the field. <laughs> and this is a true story. So the game starts, and the first pitch, Steve's standing in second base, and the guy is really in bad shape. And I said, this is terrible. A shot ground ball shot, is hit to second. And Steve, I say, I didn't have time to think too much, but I said, this is not good. That ball is going toward him. And this guy stopped that ball, caught the ball. He's now laying down. He throws the ball to first base. He gets about. I said, it's the most incredible thing. I've never seen athletic. I've never seen anything like this. Right? And he gets him out, and they then took him out of the game, which was a very wise thing, because you could never do that again in a million years. But you weren't going to let that ball go through. I don't care if it was hit by the greatest of all time, right? That ball was not going through you, because you are a warrior. Steve, he is fantastic. You are fantastic. You and Liz and Kevin, what a great, what a group. I mean, what a group. I got lucky. I got lucky, because you need the right people. If I had the wrong people there, be, uh, maybe a different story. Maybe we'd be celebrating something else. But I really want to thank you, Steve Scalise. And Elise, you, I just read this story. It's just, uh, most incredible what's going on with you, Elise. So I even said, you know, I was up campaigning for helping her, but I thought, she looks good. She looks like good talent. But did I not realize when she opens that mouth, you were killing them, Elise. <laughs> you were killing them. <laughs> Elise, and there's a big story in the New York Post. I love the New York Post because they treat me well. There aren't too many of you that do, but today you're treating me well. I even had a great headline. I, New York Times, Washington Post. I had all these great headlines. Maybe we should just end it right there. But you had the greatest story yesterday in the Post, that people from all over the country are contributing to her campaign. They were so enthralled with the way you handled yourself, what you said, the way you said it. And uh, I'll always be your friend. I think it, it was, it's really an amazing story. What a great future you have. What a great future. Thank you. <laughs> First Lady agrees, by the way. First Lady agrees. And Michael Turner, you can represent me anytime. Where's Michael? Where is he? Well, you can represent me. How good were you? There's another 
There's another Perry Mason type, I think, right? What do you think, John? But, Michael, you were fantastic, and we appreciate it. Brad Winstrup. Where's Brad? Brad. Great. Great. Uh, it's a big day for lawyers. You notice only the lawyers stayed. They, all the lawyers stayed behind. Lee Zeldin, how good are you? How good are you? Man. And, Lou, your name's not down. They didn't give me a name. Do you know if, if I didn't announce Louie, whoever the hell made this list, I, I got to get rid of him because I, if I wouldn't have announced Louie, it might have been the end of the presidency. <laughs> Louie, you have been so great, so tough, and so smart. I got it. I got it. But Louie has been amazing. He's a tough guy. He's a smart guy. He's streetwise like crazy. We love Texas. And we're with you all the way, Louis. We're with you all the way. Thank you very much. So, so that's the story. We have a great group of warriors, and there are others left. And I guess probably, I'm sure I didn't mention a few, and I apologize if that's the case. Uh, how's CPAC doing? Good? Uh, my man, stand up, please, will you? He's the one. He said, you should run. Matt said, it's like five years ago, six years ago, and I made a speech, and then they do some kind of a straw poll. Who made the best speech? And he said, I made the best speech. Oh, with all these professional, I hate to say this, with all these professional politicians, they voted by far the best speech was Trump. He calls me, he says, you should run for politics. I say, what do I know about politics? But you know what? We learned quickly, and our country has never done better than it's doing right now. So it's pretty good. But thank you, Matt. Great. Say hello. So, so that's the story. We've been treated very unfairly. Fortunately, we have great men and women that came to our defense. If we didn't, this would have been a horrific incident for our country. When you have Lisa and Peter, the lovers, the FBI lovers, I want to believe the path you threw out for Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. That's the office. There's no way he gets elected, meaning me. There's no way he gets elected. This is Peter Delisa. He's probably trying to impress her for obvious reasons. <laughs> There's no way he gets elected. But I'm afraid we can't take the risk. Now, think of this. In other words, if I get elected, they can't, they, two lowlifes, they can't take their risk. They can't take their risk. Think of it. And that's where it came up, the greatest word of all insurance policy. So he says, but I'm afraid we can't take the risk. She may lose. It's like an insurance policy. In the unlikely event, you die before you're 40. In other words, if I won, they were going to do exactly what they did to us. They were going to try and overthrow the government of the United States, a duly elected president. And if I didn't fire James Comey, we would have never found this stuff. Because when I fired that sleazebag, all hell broke out. They were ratting on each other. They were running for the hills. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. It's in the hands of some very talented people. We're going to have to see what happens. But I can tell you, in my opinion, these are the crookedest, most dishonest, dirtiest people I've ever seen. They said, this is struck. God, Hillary should win 100 million to one. This is about me. This is an agent from the FBI. Look how they let her off. 33,000 emails. Deleted. Nothing happens to her. Nothing happens. It's unbelievable. But think of that. God, Hillary should win. When these guys are investigating Hillary. Then they go to work for Mueller, the two of them. And when Mueller found out that everybody knew that they were 100 percent this way, he let them go. But they deleted all of their emails and text messages. 
So when we got the phone, they were all deleted. Could you imagine the treasure trove? They illegally deleted. So they left, they left Bob Mueller. He had the look, but he didn't have a lot of other things. Always had the look, he missed a G-man. And I love the FBI, and the FBI loves me, 99%. It was the top scum, and the FBI people don't like the top scum. So think of that, 100 million to one, and he's investigating me. And then, God, Trump is a loathsome human being, isn't he? These are the people looking at me. I'm really not a bad person. And Paige said, yes, he's awful. How would you like to have that? This is just, this is the good stuff. This stuff, a hundred times worse than that. These are all dirty people. And now, I just heard that they're suing the United States of America because they were interfered with. Ah, uh, not gonna let it happen. Just not gonna let it happen. We cannot let this happen to our country. Okay. So, I'm gonna leave now. And I don't know if any of you have anything to say. You could say it, but this is sort of a day of celebration because we went through hell. And I'm sure that Pelosi and uh, Crying Chuck, I've known this guy all the time. The only time I ever saw him cry was when it was appropriate. Known him for a long time, Crying Chuck. But I'm sure they'll try and cook up other things. They'll go through the state of New York. They'll go through other places. They'll do whatever they can. Because instead of wanting to heal our country and fix our country, all they want to do, in my opinion, it's almost like they want to destroy our country. We can't let it happen. Uh, Jim Jordan, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Huh? Mark? I just, I want to just say that uh, this reflection today is, is a small reflection of the kind of support you have all across the country. We've got your back. Yeah. This was a, a highly partisan situation. Pelosi said, I, I copied it down exactly. Before the impeachment, she wanted to impeach from day one, by the way. Don't let it fool you. You know, she said, no, the impeachment is a very serious thing. I said, she wants to impeach. Watch. Impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and so overwhelming and bipartisan, Bipartisan. It was 197 to nothing. And other than one failed presidential candidate, and I call that half a vote because he actually voted for us on the other one. But we had one failed presidential candidate. That's the only half a vote we lost. So we had almost 53 to nothing. We had 197 to nothing. And the only one that voted against was a guy that can't stand the fact that he ran one of the worst campaigns in the history of the presidency. But she said, there's something so compelling, has to be so compelling and so overwhelming and bipartisan. I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country. She was right about that. And it's just not worth it. That was Nancy Pelosi a year ago, right? And I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame. But as I said, if we can put this genius to work on roads and highways and bridges and all of the things we can do, prescription drugs. You know, we had Secretary Azar is here, and I want to thank him for this, but we had uh, first time in 51 years where drug prices actually came down last year. First time in 51 years. But what we can do working with both parties in Congress is would be unbelievable. It'd be unbelievable what we can do. And I know Chuck Grassley is working very hard on it, and Mitch is working very hard on it. But what we can do is, is incredible. What we can do just generally. We've done so much without it. We've rebuilt our military. We've cut regulations at a level that nobody thought possible. We'll always protect our Second Amendment. We all know that. But I just want to tell you that it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, I want to apologize to my family for having them have to go through 
a phony, rotten deal by some very evil and sick people. And Ivanka's here, and my, my sons, and my whole family. And that includes Barron. That includes Barron, who's up there as a young boy. Stand up, honey. Ivanka, thank you, honey. Come. So I just want to thank my family for sticking through it. This was not part of the deal. I was going to run for president, and if I won, I was going to do a great job. I didn't know that I was going to run, and then when I got in, I was going to have to run again and again and again. Every week, I had to run again. That wasn't the deal, but they stuck with me. And I'm so glad I did it, because we are making progress and doing things for our great people that everybody said couldn't be done. Our country is thriving. Our country is just respected again. And it's an honor to be with the people in this room. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. listening to President Trump speak for more than an hour now inside of the East Room after his acquittal in the Senate impeachment trial. The president calling that speech a celebration at one point early on in the speech, holding up newspapers from today, showing the headlines, acquittal, the president saying he'd never received headlines like that, at least not recently. The speech part hep rally, part airing a list of grievances and classic Donald Trump. Now, there was no teleprompter in the speech, and we had no prepared remarks. At one point, the president using an expletive to describe the Russia investigation. Um, but he did speak about the Russia investigation. He spoke about the impeachment, a range of issues, including at times the bizarre, including at times Representative Jim Jordan's body, Representative Steve Scalise looks. He was sort of all over the place at times. And, and he did take some shots. There was a settling of scores going on as well, calling Speaker Nancy Pelosi nasty, uh, vicious, also saying the same about Chief Impeachment Prosecutor Adam Schiff, calling this all very ugly, saying the word impeachment itself is very ugly. ABC's White House Chief Correspondent Jonathan Carl was inside the room at the time. And John, have you ever experienced anything quite like that yet? Uh, no, Tom, but how many times have we said that following an event with Donald Trump? I mean, this was an unusual, uh, unprecedented scene here in the East Room. The president came out and started by saying this is not a speech, this is not a press conference, this is a celebration. And he proceeded, of course, to thank all, or not all, but most of the supporters here in the room. Uh, it seemed that for a time like he was going to thank each and every person in this room. Uh, but he also had some incredible incredibly vicious words uh, directed towards uh, his uh, opponents. Uh, he called um, James Comey a sleazebag. Talking about Robert Mueller, he referred to the top scum at the FBI. Uh, regarding Nancy Pelosi, as you pointed out, he insulted her several times. And he also uh, said that he doesn't think that she prays. Uh, it was a uh, very uh, personal, pointed attacks peppered with lavish praise for the Republican Republicans in this room, which, by the way, what a group of, of Republican leadership. If there was ever a doubt, and there isn't anymore, that this is Donald Trump's uh, party, uh, you know, you had all the Republican leadership here, his cabinet, and uh, and many others here in the room. Yeah, and other, other vocal Trump supporters as well in that room. All right, Jonathan Carl, for us, I want to bring in ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran in Washington. Terry, a back and forth between the president and Speaker Nancy Pelosi this morning, even before the president's White House remarks we just heard the president taking aim at her and Senator Mitt Romney, the only Republican to vote to convict him without mentioning either by name, focusing on faith. Let's take a listen. I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. Nor do I like people who say 
I pray for you when they know that that's not so. Now, a short time later, the speaker at her weekly news conference had this to say. I don't know if the president understands about prayer or people who do pray, uh, but we do pray uh, for the United States of America. I pray for him. Terry, this is all the fallout from the impeachment trial. There used to be an unspoken rule in politics. You don't go after someone's faith. That did not happen today. That didn't, and that was the unspoken rule. Faith was one of those things that was kind of the background reality of American life, respected in our individual faith traditions or beliefs or lack thereof, uh, as, as a conscience uh, in the, each individual. And that is at the core of American equality. One respects each other's choice. We didn't fight with faith, with words of faith. I've been in plenty of countries that do. They're troubled. They're usually violent. They're hateful. Uh, th this is definitely crossing a line here. When we wield the words of, of belief, when we scorn each other's professions of faith, uh, at the highest level of American politics, two constitutional officers, the president and the speaker of the house, spitting contempt on each other's professions of faith, uh, that is a new low in American political discourse. And I think what we saw from the president, he is changing the way president Presidents speak for better or worse, and probably for the worse. Presidents, one of the things that we looked to them to do was set a standard of how we can talk to each other in a very diverse and pluralistic country where, where feelings do run high, where tempers do flare in, in politics. And presidents who were expected to fight for us and scrap for us were also expected to raise the level of our debate. Trump takes it down. He takes it down into profanity, into vulgarity, uh, into, into the very depths of the language. And joyfully, gleefully, this is his moment of triumph, and he chooses it uh, really to go after his opponents, and one can understand his feelings, in the worst possible way. The, the language of presidents, which used to be elevated, has changed. Terry, you know, before the impeachment proceedings even started, there were members on both sides of the aisle that warned, once you go down this road, there's no going back. These are polarized times in D.C. This may be peak polarization right now. You heard the president's speech in there. He basically thanked everyone who was loyal to him, and he went after anyone who wasn't on his side. Well, it's been a terrible fight, and I certainly understand that. Uh, he has fought off an effort to drive him from office, which he believes was illegitimate, and his supporters helped him do that. Uh, and uh, a victory lap is entirely understandable. As for polarization, we have been polarized. I'm old enough to remember you know, the, the, the ni late 1960s, early 1970s, vicious polarization in this country. People worried about it. I remember my parents very concerned, the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and the killings at Kent State, it seemed the country was coming apart. Uh, but our leaders, despite the fact that they were very divided too, still tried to speak the language of, of civic fighting, civic argument, but at a, at a level that wouldn't take us down. I think what we're seeing today is that everybody has given themselves permission to be the worst version of themselves in every political moment, beginning with the president of the United States. All right, Terry Moran for us. Now, the president, of course, has been acquitted in the impeachment trial, but the investigations may not end there. ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, joins us now. Pierre, the president had a lot to say about both the Democrats that were investigating him in the impeachment, but also the FBI. He used some choice words for James Comey and other FBI agents. The, the president is clearly very bitter about some of the FBI officials, uh, former officials who were in leadership positions. He is extremely upset with two officials who, during the campaign, 2016 campaign, uh, in text messages with one another, had very uh, awful things to say about him, divisive things to say about him. He has not let that go. He also clearly cannot stand, and uh, let's make it in simple terms, uh, former FBI Director James Comey. Uh, he spoke disparagingly about uh, former FBI director and special counsel uh, Bob Mueller. Uh, this was a moment where the president portrayed himself as victim, uh, very angry at those people. Uh, 
One thing we should say, though, as far as we know, uh, those senior officials that he pointed to, uh, none of them did anything in terms of the investigation during the campaign where it was leaked out. If they wanted to hurt him the most, it would have been done during that period of time. A lot of people in the FBI have told me. Uh, he also said uh, many things about uh, the Bureau in terms of how it's conducting itself. But the Bureau still moves forward, uh, and the president um, will have to continue to deal with them. Uh, new FBI Director Chris Wray is in there now dealing with some of the, uh, the aftermath in terms of how the Russia investigation was initially launched. So one of the things we see is distress on the Justice Department and those institutions remains in part because of the past relationship that the president has had with some of those top officials, Tom. Yeah, the president's saying his enemies came after him the moment he came down that escalator when he announced his candidacy four years ago. All right, Pierre, thank you. The impeachment coming to an end just as the race for 2020 officially begins. ABC's Rachel Scott joins us now from Manchester, New Hampshire, where the Democratic candidates are preparing for tomorrow night's ABC News debate ahead of Monday's primary there, Tuesday's primary. But Rachel, we've learned the president plans to be in New Hampshire as well. Tom, it will be the president's first time back in front of his supporters following that Senate vote to acquit. The president will be holding a rally right here in Manchester just one day before the New Hampshire primary. And the vice president is expected to be on the ground as well, taking a bus trip throughout the state. Now, this is all part of the Trump campaign strategy to try to upstage the Democrats. We have seen them use this counter programming before ahead of the Iowa caucuses during the impeachment hearings. But this is a state the president lost in 2016 by fewer than 3,000 votes. The Trump campaign telling me today they believe it is in play for 2020, Tom. Rachel Scott in a snowy Manchester today. All right, Rachel, thank you. And a reminder that ABC News and WMUR will host a Democratic debate in New Hampshire tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC. And you can always get the latest on ABC News Live, streaming everywhere with breaking news, context, and analysis. And, of course, always at abcnews.com. And there will be a complete wrap-up later on World News Tonight with David Muir. We return you now to regularly scheduled programming. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Thank you for watching. This has been a special report from ABC News. This is what being live is all about. I can see pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Neighborhoods are underwater. 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Imagine breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Imagine instant, incredible access to the most compelling live video. That's grenade. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all the most innovative storytellers, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments this is live? all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? Go We're there now. To put this fire out right now. With ABC News Live. Think of it as your live streaming adrenaline rush. Just look at all of the smoke here. Real, raw, live. The Columbus Zoo. No matter where the next step takes us, we're taking it. It's frightening. And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Behind the scenes, exclusive access. Take you inside for an extraordinary tour here at ABC News Live. This is it. It's time to go there, Blind, be there, cloud. experience it live on the scene. <laughs> Maybe We're that's there. why, in just one year, ABC News Live is already America's number one live streaming news. No, no, and imagine no, no, this, no, no, no. it's free. Wow. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and abcnews.com. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere right to you. Hi everybody, I'm Peter Travers. This is Popcorn, where we tell you what's happening at the movies. And there's a movie now that you can see on Netflix called The Two Popes. And it stars my guest today, Jonathan Price and Anthony Hopkins, who are playing 
guess what? The title characters and doing doing it brilliantly. So, Jonathan, welcome. Thank welcome. you. Welcome. Great. Pope Francis, there you are. Um, the big news now about Pope Francis is his encounter with this woman in the crowd yeah, where he yeah. sort of slapped her hand, yeah, you know? Yeah. Have, have you been being asked this question now? No, I've been asked to, to, would I please slap their hands? The hand, whoa, yeah. really? Okay, yeah, the do gold. it, do it. I want to be grabbed. <laughs> at the Golden Globes, there was a lot of uh, grabbing and pushing and pulling, and uh, I was often tempted to slap. But I feel really sorry for him because people aren't seeing the whole sequence of mm -hmm. that video where... Uh, that particular woman grabbed him very hard, pulled, really? yanked him. Yanked him, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's, uh, he's an old man with sciatica. It's bound to hurt. Well, let's talk about the two popes in terms of the whole concept of you being offered this to play uh, Jorge Bergoglio, the Argentinian pope. Because we don't see him in the movie being the Pope, really. It's, it's Not a the lot, yeah. walk up to that. Yeah. While Anthony Hopkins is playing Pope Benedict, um, German he is. You're an Argentinian. Two Welshmen playing these parts. Yeah. Somebody yeah. must have said, that's what we need. It's two Welshmen yeah. to do this. Together at last, that, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. it's time for a Welsh Pope, definitely. <laughs> well, when I was watching and, and watching you play this, I kept thinking of this other Argentinian you played, which was Juan Perón in yeah. Vida. Yeah. <laughs> there you are, the dictator. In a way, a pope can be a dictator, but Pope Francis Bergoglio is the liberal reformer, the one that yeah. wants to give a more compassionate look at the church. Yeah. Did you have any trepidation about playing this? Um, just... Just the usual about whether I want to do any part that I'm offered. Is that how you approach them all? Uh, well, no? Negative no. <laughs> First say no. Um, no, I thought, um, I thought I'd be on a hiding to nothing uh, representing this, this particular pope. But that feeling didn't last very long once I read the script and once I knew that Fernando Morales was going to be directing it. I definitely wanted to do it. and. Uh, I think it was mainly to do with the fact that I'm, I'm not religious. I, I was brought up in the Christian faith. I mm -hmm. went to church until I was a teenager. Um, but I found that this pope was the first pope who I thought was speaking to me and millions like me about issues that weren't necessarily to do with the church or organized religion, but to do with politics and to do with speaking out uh, for the environment and about the economy and about the injustices that are in the world. So I, uh, he was someone that I felt great empathy uh, towards. And it helped that I looked like him a bit. And I walk like him, definitely. Um, even though he's got 10 years on me. You could sneak into the Vatican, maybe, you know, when he's well, somewhere when he's, else. Yeah, when he's know, busy. Busy, right. Yeah. And just yeah. take over yeah. and do what you would need to do. Yeah, yeah. Does that give you a feeling when you're playing that, that this was what I would do? if I were in the Pope's shoes. I wouldn't be so presumptuous uh, to think that, but I'm, I'm glad he's doing what he's doing. Um, obviously, he's got, there's the whole church and Vatican side of things, which he doesn't seem to be able to deal with or conquer. But, um, and you're constantly reading lots of stories about how he's disliked within the Vatican because he's a reformer, mm -hmm. and people don't want that change. And uh, I think that's why he became Pope. He was. Uh, be made Pope in order to make these changes. Otherwise, uh, why choose him? Because he was, uh, you know, there'd never been a, an Ar a Latin American Pope, mm -hmm. an Argentinian Pope. And the film implies, uh, although we don't necessarily know the truth of it, that Benedict wanted Bergoglio to be the next Pope because he saw in him things that he couldn't achieve and he couldn't do. He saw, in many ways, his opposite, yeah, yeah. you know, didn't he? Yeah. And this is it. I mean, I didn't mention this in, in the introduction, but Benedict was a pope who retired, who said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. And so we have two popes who are alive in yeah. this world today. And yeah. there are the clips at the end of the real popes, you know, seeming to have having a really terrific time. When I saw the first a cut of the film, I was a bit disturbed that they were showing the real popes at the end of the film because I thought it would uh, invalidate everything we've been doing for the previous two <laughs> hours. But what you see in these two men is a, is a 
they come into you. It's just a welcoming, the way they greet each other mm -hmm. with great affection. And you can see the respect they have for each other. And far from taking away from our performances, it, they, it enhances, it gives an, an element of truth to what we were doing. It's a really terrific script in this. I think people here, it's the two popes, what am I gonna say? Yeah. These two guys talking to each other. Yeah. Which sometimes scares people when they go to the movies. <laughs> they yeah, yeah. want that, but yet, Amaras as a director makes this movie move so beautifully. Yeah. It's a gorgeous thing to look at. Yeah. It's also sometimes hilarious yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> that that's going on. Did you all know that that was what was going to happen before you did it? No, no, yeah, because I, I think I, what's, what's wonderful about the film is that it, uh, it's such a surprise for audiences. Once you, once you, you've got to get them in there. You do. And then once they're in there, uh, it's a surprise. Um, because it's it's much funnier than I ever expected, or the and what the audience expect, and um, I think the way we made the film, there was no we didn't have many preconceptions. I, I don't remember ever talking to Tony. Um, I'm going to be like this, and he said I'm going to be like this, and Fernando said I want you to do this, want you to do that. <laughs> the whole process was really organic uh, because we had the the strength of that script bit underneath us, you know, holding us up. And um, so when I saw it, and the way Fernando put it together, because he says the, uh, his work starts in the editing room. You know, he lets us do mm -hmm. what we want and uh, encourages us to go certain ways. But That's when right. I let saw them do what they want, yeah, it was for a, a bit of that. Yeah. I'll fix it later. Yeah, right. yeah. good directors do that. They let you think you're you're uh, you're coming up with the goods, mm -hmm. even though they're quietly feeding things in your ear. <laughs> they let you think it's your idea. Um, so when I saw it, it was a, I, I didn't know it was going to be so funny right and from or the beginning, humorous. You know? Right from, I mean, that first scene yeah. of your character trying to book his own uh, plane reservations yeah. on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, apparently he did that. That's what he did. But it's uh, the first time I saw it with a, a big audience was at Telluride, mm -hmm. and because uh, you don't know what, what to expect. And that moment, the right at the beginning of the film, where the, the audience laughs as one, a huge wave of laughter. You can feel the audience sit, I certainly sat back and thought, phew, mm -hmm. they're going to enjoy this. And you can feel the audience sitting back and saying, this is, this is going to be OK. You can. It's like, yeah. Yeah. OK, you yeah. know, bring it on, make this yeah. happen. And yet, it also doesn't avoid the controversies that no, no. exist within the church now. Yeah. Um, uh, the whole thing with the problem priests, the yeah. predators that are there, and also their histories. Yeah. Can you talk a little about his history, Bergoglio, it, back in the 70s in terms of Argentina? Yeah, well, it, it's all, mercifully, it's all in the film. It is there. And we didn't shy away from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were applauded and thanked uh, by the people, of, people in Buenos Aires when they saw the film. We had a screening there. Because they... Their fear was that this was going to be a, a whitewash job, mm -hmm. a gloss over, a hagiography of, of Bergoglio, because he is still seen as a divisive character in Argentina because of his perceived involvement with the colonels. Mm -hmm. I found on uh, YouTube footage of him being interrogated by or questioned by his peers, fellow cardinals, about his involvement with the colonels. And you see a very different man to the man you see smiling on the balcony when he's made pope. He's, he's very doer, he's quite angry. I think he's impatient, he's drumming his fingers on the table. Mm. And uh, I put that image together with talking to uh, a Jesuit priest in Buenos Aires who worked with him, uh, who said that they didn't like him. He was uh, very, he always uh, stay, he stayed by himself, he didn't mix. Um, uh, he was, uh, he never smiled, and when they saw him on the balcony, this smiling Pope, they didn't recognize him because he was smiling. <laughs> didn't recognize no. him. <laughs> and, uh, Who is this they, person? Yeah, but then you do get the other side of him, where he was, you know, you see him in the film, you see him uh, saying mass in the, the kind of slum township areas, um, and he, the other sides of him was very popular. So you, you, it, it's not a, 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 a biopic, it's not a hagiography of this man, it's a, it's a warts and all study of him. Um, and I think we've been fair to him 
because we all respect him and admire him. Um, and we had a screening in Rome three or four weeks ago where members of the Vatican came to see it. Really? Him. And um, they said they'd, they'd liked it, they'd enjoyed it. Um, and a particular cardinal um, who's uh, a, a friend, Turkson, who's a friend of Benedict and of uh, Francis, um, he'd liked the film very much. Fernando, the director, said, do you think we were too hard on the church? And he said, you weren't hard enough. Whoa. But he also said that he thought Francis would like the film and he wanted a DVD to take to him to show him the film. Oh, I'd love to so, see uh, that review. Yeah, see that review right. for me. Yeah. <laughs> what would... Two stars, Vatican. <laughs> nice. For the poster. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. The poster, that would, that'd be good. That would... And also from uh, uh, Francis's family in Argentina. Fernando got an email to say that they'd seen it. They'd enjoyed the film and they, they liked what uh, we'd done uh, representing their uncle. So that was, that was really nice to call him their uncle. Uncle, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Uncle Jorge. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. that's who he is yeah. to do it. Well, how were you and Anthony Hopkins together, you know? You haven't made anything or done anything before, really. Well, we've been on a, we're both on a recording of Under Milkwood, the Dylan Thomas poem that was produced by George Martin. Mm -hmm. Really? That was like the 27 Beatles years ago. Go. The okay. Beatles producer, yeah. yeah. And um, Tony was first voice and I was second voice. And you come 27 years later, we're in Rome, and the call sheet has, uh, you know, it, you're rated as your importance in the film, the number you're oh, allocated. That's right, yeah. mm -hmm. And I was number one, and Tony was number two. So it was my revenge after 27 years. <laughs> Got it, you're But we'd greet each other every morning with uh, morning number one, morning number two. <laughs> and uh, it went on from there. But we. Uh, it's interesting that the, what happens to the two men in the film is reflected with what happened to Tony and I because, you know, in the film you see two men sort of sniffing around each other like a pair of dogs, quite wary of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I was that wary of uh, Tony, but I was, you know, I was, uh, I'm, I'm in awe of Tony Hopkins. I'm a great admirer of his. So, and that played into those early scenes. And as you see, the Pope's relationship growing, so my friendship with Tony grew. And uh, it, it is the equivalent of both of us, all of us, tangoing together by the end of it. That's a good way to put yeah. it. That is that is what it is. But, I mean, he is one of the sweetest, <laughs> nicest people, you know? Yeah. There's just nothing about Anthony Hopkins that makes you go, oh. No, no, no. Except no. maybe the reputation. Yeah, reputation from way back, which yeah. uh, um, Tony uh, talks about. I mean, he's a, um, I don't know if you say reformed alcoholic, but he's been dry for many, yeah. many years. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's great compassion for people, and he's, uh, he's very open uh, in public, um, but he does like to be by himself. He's never happier than when he's in his studio painting, which he does every day. He's not acting. Well, which is a good thing. It's is, a great thing. Is that a, how does that with you? Do you like to when you're not working? Basically I, I go off be, somewhere? I seem to be never not Always working. Work. <laughs> Always never, on. Always never on. not yeah. working. Never not. Can't say no to how a job. How did that start with you growing up in Wales, where you said somehow, you know, this is what I want to do? Well, I, I didn't say it. You did? Never said it. <laughs> Someone came and just yanked you. And kind of. Just, kind of. I went to, I left school at 16 and went to art school. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to paint. And eventually I went to a teacher training college to train to teach art. And uh, you had to do a secondary course. So I chose drama because I was told it was the easiest course to do that required the least amount of work. And it was true. And, um, but somebody, when I was at college, somebody, a, a tutor from another college saw me act and said, have you ever thought of being an actor? Because I think you should and I think you should go to RADA, where he'd been, and he sent for the papers to audition and things. Um, and I was accepted at RADA, and they gave me a scholarship, and um, I never became a teacher. You never um, looked back. Never, never went back. back. Your career is just too huge for me to deal with in the space of this time, but you played 
so much Shakespeare, from Hamlet to Lear, you yeah, know, with yeah. The Merchant of Venice, which yeah. I got to see, yeah. which is in, with your daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you met your wife, too, while you were acting, right, yeah. in the beginning of that. Yeah. You have one of the most successful long marriages in this crazy business that's 48 there. years this year. Yeah. yeah. So what is it? Only, we've you, only been married five years. Oh, that, I heard we that. Uh, you we, made it official we, only yeah. much later. We weren't sure about each other, so we waited. <laughs> yes. We waited. That's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And, the, and purposely, do you say to yourself, I want to not play the same thing? Yeah. Because you, you're a Bond villain. Yeah. <laughs> You've done that. And that character, Elliot Carver, is one of the great villains to me because he's his own Rupert Murdoch yeah, yeah. figure yeah. of doing this. Yeah. And then at one point in your career, you said, you know what, I'm going to do musicals. I'm yeah. going to be in Miss Saigon. And then I'm going to, well, you did Oliver. You did uh, Henry Higgins in yeah. My Fair Lady. Yeah. What is this? Is it a master plan that you have? <laughs> I keep moving before yes. they find you before out. They, yeah. yeah, yeah.